Welcome to Snowmobile Sessions Live on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. It's the number one destination to learn about snowmobiling, network with other sledders, and have an awesome time doing it. We'll meet other snowmobilers that share your passion and show your fan photos along the way. Snowmobile Sessions Live. Enjoy the ride. This episode of Snowmobile Sessions Live is brought to you by Energy Power Sports. They're Oakville's full-line BRP dealer with sales and service to all BRP models and so much more. Energy Power Sports always has the fun in store with a wide selection of clothing, parts, and accessories for all your power sports passions. Make Energy Power Sports your source for Can-Am off-road ATV and side-by-sides. Can-Am on-road Riker and Spider, including the sporty F3S, Sea-Doo watercraft and switch pontoon boats and Alumacraft fishing boats powered by Mercury Marine. Put yourself on a Manitou pontoon or a widescape stand-up snowmobile. Energy Power Sports is the home for Lynx and Ski-Doo snowmobiles for the entire family. Do you feel the energy? Energy Power Sports, 879 Cranberry Court, Oakville, Ontario, or online, energypowersports.ca. Hey everybody, how's it going tonight? We got uh, Doug from Side by Side Blog, a little channel down south of us. How are you doing today, Doug? Good, Gary, how are you tonight? Excellent, and I brought Drew on, who's arguably the number one Side by Side Blog fan. Let me just, let me just also... show it. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard, there we go, that works. My man, my Get man. Your... Yeah, he wears it more than the Mudbrat shirt, so we're going to have to have a talk about that. <laughs> Get but, your merch uh, at seeontheBigEnd.com. <laughs> exactly. Right, yeah. And you can, Thanks, win, you can win great prizes. Mm -hmm. Actually, that part's over now, isn't it? That you can, uh, you're giving away a, a, yeah, it was it was a tremor, a, a Ford tremor. And, and then yeah, I've got my heyday shirt on where you see here. You got Matt and Doug from Side by Side Blog. It's all backwards there, but they're right <laughs> I there. I recognize that signature. Yeah, right there. So yeah, my crew was down at Hades, and they had you sign it, and then they they sent me the picture of. It. I'm going, Jacob. Why didn't you ask him on the pod then? <laughs> that was a why chaotic show. That was a chaotic show. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Yeah. Awesome. So, well, thanks for having me on, guys. This is this is yeah, great. No problem. Love the Anytime, intro. By yeah. the way. Guys are killing it. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're professionals. <laughs> As professionals, we can get the unprofessionals. The yeah, unprofessionals. you got it. So, how did how did it all start? Like, how what's the the backstory on side by side blog? Got very much just a hobby. So, uh, I bought my first machine was a 2013 Can Am Maverick, and uh, a couple other guys, you know, got them. And we were just really into the sport, right? It was exciting and new and fresh. Things were moving fast. And uh, in 2015, everybody was anticipating Yamaha dropping a new side by side, a sport side by side. It turned out to be the YXZ. And we had actually found the patent information on it. So suddenly we found ourselves as the, you know, only people in the general public who knew what this machine was going to be. And we're freaking out, right? What do we do with this information? We got to tell people, how do we tell people? And uh, ultimately the solution was to start a blog so we can talk about, you know, rumors in this new machine. So side by side blog was started as a literal blog, um, which later transitioned into a YouTube channel we carried the name over, you know, so now the name doesn't make as much sense, but at the time that's uh, what kicked it off. So the whole thing was a hobby for, you know, a number of years until it caught enough traction. We realized we could actually do something with it, but uh, yeah. So you just... were, at, you were in the side-by-side -side game long before the, the, the blog started then. Yeah. Um, I bought my first one in 2014 i think it was early 2014 and then uh we formed the website in 2015 sometime i think early 2015 um late 2015 we made our first youtube video but again just you know for fun and then uh did that for 
little over three years before we decided to turn it into a business. Yeah. That's uh, that's cool. And then you always say in your videos that that you are a snowmobiler. You bring snowmobile into the other crew, you know, saying, yep. you know, I love it so much. Uh, I know you guys will too. Tell us a bit about your background snowmobiling. Yeah, I finally got these guys in the snowmobile and a couple of them have done, but uh, I'm winning them over. So, yeah, that uh, has been my favorite power sport since I was probably 10 years old. And it drives some of these guys crazy because I've told them that all along, that snowmobiles are still better than side-by-sides. I love them both, but I'm still a snowmobiler at heart. Um, but, yeah, uh, dad and mom were a snowmobiler way back in the day, you know, so we're riding doubles around when I'm a tiny kid. Uh, went for a number of years where financially we couldn't have sleds. And then uh, I had an uncle that gave me a 76 Exciter when I was probably 10, right? Didn't nice. run all busted up, fixed it up, got it uh, run and rode it for a couple of years. And that was it. I was, I was hooked on it from there, been riding ever since. Oh, very so, cool. So you along the way. Got them. Yeah. So what's the newest, what's the newest sled that you, you own? The newest now, sled, or... the newest sled that I own personally is getting old now. It's a 2012 Apex XTX. Um, oh, sweet. I was trail riding that a ton um, for a few years. And then when side-by-sides started popping off and we got really into that and it progressed into a business, you know, that really took over life. So for a number of years there, I didn't ride snowmobile a whole lot. And every year I'd say, I'm going to buy a new sled. I'm going to buy a new sled. Haven't had as much time to ride, so I haven't done it. Um, but now we have this 2023 uh, Indy 850 in the shop as a prize yeah. for our challenge. So I'm fixing to win that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a thing. It's a, uh, it's a sweet ride. That's for sure. I did see in the one video that, uh, that you had a Skidoo X team jacket that, that I think it was, um, Joe put on Joe or Matt, um, needed a jacket and you said to throw mine on. And he came back and it was the, it was a Skidoo X team. Is it just because it was cheap or here? I thought you were a Skidoo owner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not really, I couldn't tell you where that jacket came from. Honestly, <laughs> there's so many random pieces of clothing around here. I couldn't tell you the history on half of it, but uh, no, my uh, dad was into Yamaha's back in the day and you know, that's just kind of how things go. So I got yeah. into them. So I've owned mostly Yamaha sleds. You know, I've messed around with some other teams and done a little Articat stuff here and there, a little player stuff here and there. But personally, I've always just owned Yamahas. Yeah, yeah. When you when you own something, you keep with it, right? That's been the case. I, We're branching out now. We're branching out now. But yeah, I do have full respect though, because if if any of the viewers haven't seen it, you have to watch the Cheap Sled Challenge on Side by Side Blog's YouTube channel and. Every year they have a budget of it lets I'll let you tell the whole rules of it, but I just wanted to say that Joe, the new kid, Joey. ultimate respect for him, Joey. You tell Joey that that he's got my total utmost respect because he he picked up a rev, but he also knew exactly what the rev was all about. And yeah. uh, very few people can explain it like that. And I was like, when I watched that, I went a boy, man. Like you didn't just buy a cheap sled. You bought the, the cheap sled. <laughs> Let, let's not ignore the fact that it has a really bad beaver tail conversion. And the track is like a drag track for like a slick pad. Like <laughs> It's a little rough, but for 1500 bucks, what do you, what are you going to do? I don't do, think, you know? I don't think I could find one for 1500 bucks if I tried. <laughs> Yeah. The worst part yeah. about that is I was absolutely going to buy a rev because I knew in that price range, like the rev chassis is the best chassis you're going to find. And I didn't because I figured everybody was going to find revs. And I thought I'll yeah. change it up a little bit, keep some diversity in the group. It turns out Joey was the only one that got one. So I'm kicking myself a little bit, but yeah, but you got the F seven, which is a killer. Like that yeah. is a great machine. So, I mean, the, the, uh, you don't underestimate that 700. It's a beast. 
you know, super light. It's a runner. It works well. So I'm all right. Yeah. I'm and, all right. and a good suspension. I mean, that was the, 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 the fate of the F seven was the rev chassis, right? Like that, that sled was amazing. And then the pyramid frame came out and, and uh, it changed the whole way people rode and raced snowmobiles. So it was just a, it was just bad timing for Arctic cat about that, uh, how that all unfolded there. But yeah, it's, it's neat to see some of those little old sleds and then what you put them through and, and the challenges are really neat. So we're gonna have to steal some of those ideas for the, the lodge sessions guys and, and uh, do some challenges like the, in the side-by-side -side blog uh, um, format that we can, we can do as far as fuel so we're mileage be putting and... them on $20,000 machines. Not <laughs> yeah, <gonna> be the <laughs> that's the, the best part about the cheap oh, fuel the economy. Challenges. Oh, I used, I feel economy. I used 0.5 liters at a hundred kilometers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to get no. sleds. You don't care too much about, you know, yeah. I'm not oh, for sure. For sure. we got a bunch of people in the chat here today. I'll just go through a couple of names here before we get too deep into this. Wisco Sledhead was first in. He said, what's up, fella? Fellas, he said he was late in to send in photos, but Massart probably has it color covered, and he did. Uh, LaPointe 800 R is in there. What's up, fella? It's Monday already. Um, are you are you planning a side-by-side -side blogs head plan heading to Pickerel Jump in Pickerel, Wisconsin? I don't know what that is. I don't know. The pickerel, the pickerel lake jump. jump. It's it's uh, it's basically a collection of a bunch of Midwesterners getting drunk and jumping across a, a very sizable body of water with the uh, with their machines. <laughs> Sounds well, like I, something I'm interested in. Just look in. up, we'll just, look up the pickerel, <laughs> just look up pickerel lake jump on YouTube, and you'll find a bunch of videos of people doing it. It looks like okay. the best fun. It's like the mixture of people who are like they'll get like six people on like a summit 165 and try to like lake skip it. It's hilarious. Okay, That's got great. my interest. Look it up. Got my look interest. Yeah, you guys Renegade can X is water skipping challenges at the Lickerel Pick at the Pickerel Lake Jump. It's like late season. I think they do it end of March or middle of March or something. Yeah, we, yeah we've seen better. their water skipping challenges. They'll they'll be right into that. Uncle Buck says, Good evening, everyone. Greg De Degur says, Hey guys, with a shot glass. Uh no fans this year. We said Wisco Sledhead says Dustin Ingram says, Cheer boys. He's a super fan of side by side boys. Uh Rev Dude 800 says, Hey Doug. Shoo! I don't know what that means. <laughs> I say that a Massart, lot. I say that a lot. Yeah, Massart's <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah. Massart's what's up, fellas? Uh, outdoor hobby guys in the house, throwing sparks. Any experience with the Honda Talon side-by-side -side throwing sparks wants to know? Yeah, we've had a couple of them. We've had a Talon R. Well, we still have our Talon R with the Jackson uh, Turbo Kit on it. And then uh, we had a Talon X for a while as well that was stock. Uh, like the machine, super solid overall. Uh, the one we have now that we pumped up with the turbo, you know, we tend to break it a little more often, but it's, you know, it's, it's Honda stuff. It's been high quality. It's, uh, we enjoy it. We enjoy it. It's not at the level of these X3s and Pro Rs and Maverick Rs and such, but solid machine. I would never turn anybody away from one. Are you sponsored by any brands? Like I know you've got CF Moto for Hella Force, and you know you see different brands on your channel, Polaris a lot. Like, are you? Does any manufacturer step up to the plate for you? Are you kind of on your own. We have loose relationships with all of them, so we'll get support here and there. Um, we've had opportunities to, but we've never taken big sponsorship deals from the OEMs because they're always tied with some sort of exclusivity, right? And that just doesn't really work for our channel or what we're trying to accomplish or what we're trying to do. So, you know, we get some support on some parts and occasionally we get our demo units and uh, maybe deals on machines here and there, but uh, nothing major. And that's kind of by design because we just need to stay flexible to kind of do what we want in general. Offer content on everything, not just one, one pigeonhole. Right. Right. Yeah. Got to be careful think and start was... taking paychecks, you know, things change. Yeah, so. yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, I know that the, the, uh, there was the talk, you guys love the CF Moto as well. Um, and the Can-Am X3s performing like a beast that you, the, uh, the new one you got. Um, yep. Yep. amazing. Uh, Mike Leitz is in the house. Hey guys, what's up? He's got his sled ready to go for the, 
for the challenges. Rob, the oil guy's in the house. Who else? We got Adventures This Way. He's a, a big ATV guy, uh, Adventures This Way. So I knew he'd be coming in, and he messaged me this week. He was pretty excited to see you on, Doug. Um, and there's lots of snow going on. Wisco's wife is even in the house, Sled Chick 96. An outdoor hobby guy says he got three, 30 centimeters of snow last weekend. So they're still coming in. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we get your questions asked. If you have any questions for Doug on here and away we go. So, but um, what do you think as far as if you, do you have any advice for people that are looking to buy power sports, whether it be uh, a side-by-side -side or, uh, or a cheap sled? You have to, look for a chance to try these things for yourself. It's always such a tough question to answer and we get it a million times over. What's your favorite machine? What machine should I buy? And the reality is there's so much good product out there that what's the best for everybody is so personal, you know, to your preferences, to your style of riding, to where you live. It's so difficult. So if you can find an opportunity to just try this stuff, you'll make the decision for yourself, you know, fairly easily because it is all so different, but it's tough to give people guidance on what to yeah. buy, where to buy those types of things. And, and you, you coming from a snowmobiler, like I've, I've, uh, like I've snowmobiled and then I went into the e ATV world and then I came back to snowmobiling again, because there just isn't that thrill there that, that you get on a snowmobile. But when I look at the lifestyle of a side by sider, and we we uh, we have friends, the uh, Michigan Outlaws, and and they uh, they get into the side by sides hard, and it's it's um, it looks to me like the same same time of mentality that goes into snowmobile. I, I think you'd almost get the same feeling um, with it. What, what's your opinion on that? It's yeah, it's definitely coming around. In general, the people involved in the sport are excellent. It has that feel of a big family, people supporting each other in general. Um, at some level, it provides for the same type of experience and that it gives you a reason to go out and experience new places, right? And be in nature and just get outdoors. So it does the same type of important things for sure. And that's some of the best stuff we've gotten out of the sport is having a reason to go travel and see these places and meet these new people. You know, what's your preferences for how fast you want to go through the woods and whether you want to go through a narrow trail or a wide trail, whether you like driving something or riding something, it's, it's not that important. The fundamentals of it are there for sure. Do you, do you think it's a different feeling than an ATV side by sides? Most like definitely. Yeah. Like the frame of mind and the mentality and the. I think there's a lot more people in the side by side community that are a little bit more relaxed. You know, not that there isn't a relaxing portion of a snow of the snowmobile group and of the ATV group, but uh, side by sides are very easy to go out and have a relaxed, chill time with it's obviously helpful for families you have more seats you can get these four seaters five seaters so i think there's a the side by side crowd is a little bit more relaxed in general compared to your snowmobile atv riders yeah do you think it's because of the cost of entry is a lot higher so it kind of weeds out the the rednecks for lack of a better yeah, I was about to say, you know, pick your words carefully not, here. No, no <laughs> offense to any rednecks. <laughs> Put me on the spot no now. To, but yeah, it's, no offense uh, to any rednecks in the chat. <laughs> no, that's very true. You uh, you can't really be in the side-by-side -side sport at this point if you don't have some money. Like, they're all still expensive. And obviously, the used market is developing. But in general, the side-by-side -side community tends to be a little bit older people that are you know into their careers a little bit more established have some money to play with because it's not cheap no that's right that's right but uh yeah when you say about taking the family we were we were on the bike and atv this summer and we ran into a guy who took us up to this lookout and he had a honda pioneer with his two daughters little daughters in the back bouncing around and they're not really bouncing around we went over some gnarly stuff and i was impressed by where he was going with this bus 
you know, but yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. But uh, the yeah. Capabilities so, of these. Yeah. The capabilities are getting wild. They're going lots of, lots of places, which is an interesting aspect as well. They're starting to pull a lot of people who maybe were into Jeeps before or were into sand cars before they're getting good enough to draw those types of markets into side by sides. Yeah, that's true. My brother had a dune buggy that he, he built off of a, it was a, basically a Porsche boxer engine, uh, rear engine. And he, he hand built the frame and that was pretty much it. It was a two seater and it flew like he would pull wheelies on it and, and everything. And that's before like dune buggies were a thing like sand rails were, but you had to have a lot of quid in your pocket and they weren't very popular in our area. But, uh, so what does a country hick do? He goes and builds his own and it, it was, uh, it was quite fun. It would scare the bejeebas out of you big megaphone pipe out the back straight pipe <laughs> oh yeah we were into those for a minute i've yeah, had a couple sure. bw rails yeah adventures this way says hey doug i had my first ride in the new style can-am commander xmr and he was impressed with the off-road capability they uh was there like the the, the little knuckle thing that they've got over the wheel now um pardon me i don't know the terms because i'm not a a side by sider, but the uh, you know, it got a lot of flack when the pictures were released on that. What is your feeling yeah. on that? Um, I love it from an engineering standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. Like, it's a, it's a brilliant design overall, putting that pivot for the tire in the center of the tire, reducing bump steer, taking load off the ball joints. You know, I definitely understand it's a little wacky looking at first glance, but like anything else, you get used to looking at it after a while. And uh, the yeah. engineering is excellent. It's very cool. So big fan. Well, Steve's, in that, Steve's in that one video and he's just ripping in that thing, like uh, on corners through just complete trash. And that thing's tracking like it's on pavement. Yeah, it handles very flat. There is no feedback hardly at all into the steering wheel. It's super confidence inspiring. It definitely works. It works well. What was that thing that I said to you when the, that, oh, it was uh, everybody's breaking out their degrees of the University of Backyard Engineering? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, Maverick. yeah. That's, oh, I love it, too. No, I'm the exact same way. It's it's a beautiful, it's a great idea. But, yeah, like, sometimes there's a compromise to be made, and I don't know if Can-Am really thought that compromise all the way through. <laughs> There's to yeah, a certain extent they it, they didn't. I don't like the the one the problem I have with it is that even on the black ones the the knuckles are still the silver. If they painted them black, it would blend into the body more. Yeah, you would. Look better. Yeah, you probably you wouldn't, wouldn't notice. You wouldn't notice it, no. But the problem is they probably they yeah. probably want you to see it though. They probably they probably want you to see that unique feature. Yeah, right. I've seen a couple of powder coated black at this point, and it does hide it a lot. It doesn't stand out nearly as much, but. I agree. I think they wanted it to be a standout feature on the machine since it was so different than everything else. Yeah. That one has Canada on the door. Is there a reason for that? No. You know, sometimes we sit around the shop and start making stupid jokes and they go too far and then we turn them into reality. So, you know, we took the Can-Am <laughs> stickers off, put Canada stickers on instead. There's no reason or purpose, rhyme or any of that. It's... <laughs> Just one of those That's, inside jokes. We we've been there though. When you get your first, when you get a sticker machine, you have the power to make whatever you want. Of course, you're gonna put whatever the heck you want on the side of your machine. Yeah, yeah. You I know, just, sometimes you bring these ideas to life all the time. Some of them are bad ideas. They come to life anyways. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> well, Sue's kind of he's an he should be an honorary Canadian. He's a little whack like that, right? <laughs> so I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's from California originally, actually. So he's a long ways wow. away. But. Yeah, and he's and he had uh, twins recently or something like that, right? He did. He did. Yeah, he's a busy boy these days, but they're doing well. They're doing really well. I bet. I bet. Let's go back to that cheap sled challenge. Can you walk our fans through how that all works, how it started, and uh, and kind of the rules and regulations of the whole thing? Yeah, so uh, last winter we did our first one, and it was an idea that came from our guy, Matt. Uh, very simple, starting off. And last year it was $1,000, so everybody in our crew got $1,000 cash, was told to go out and buy the best snowmobile they could for 1000 bucks, 
and that was it. Keep the sled hidden. We'll do this big reveal and uh, go through a series of challenges for points just to have a good time and uh, had a blast with it. Last year, there was really no prize even. You know, we did it just to have a, a good time with, and we did drag racing. I'm trying to remember all the challenges we did last year and fuel economy. We might have done a jump contest. You did you, know. you did a, a cold start. Cold start was the first fuel one. Fuel economy was the second one. The drag yeah. race. You had the, the figure eight that you guys did in that open area too. Yep. There was a compression figure. test we threw yeah. in. Yeah. Oh, there. and the jump challenge was with the when you were doing those figure eights, uh, you guys would go up the hill and like. Oh, yeah. We did a jump, wheelie. Yeah. It was a wheelie challenge out there. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, it was just uh, let's go get some cheap sleds, fix them up a little bit, have a good time. It wasn't too awful structured, uh, but we had such a good time with it. We needed to do it again this year for sure. And uh, we upped the budget on the sleds a little bit. So everybody got 1500 bucks this year. And we recently revealed all those, um, but also have really ramped it up because we put this brand new snowmobile on the line. So this year now we have a lot more rules. It's being a lot more tightly controlled. You know, last year I bought myself a sled that I had a bunch of experience with. So I was pulling old parts out of you know, the garage, calling my buddies I used to drag race with. I got, you know, everything I need for free. And uh, this year it's it's not quite as <laughs> loose because there's a lot on the line. But same structure, $1,500 sleds. We gave everybody $250 of budget to repair or mod their sled. Um, if they need to spend more due to a breakdown, it takes points away. If you don't spend your money, you get points back. And we've got uh, a longer list of challenges we're going to do this year. And at the end, somebody's getting a free brand new sled out of the deal. So that's that's very cool. And, the, and tell them what the prize is for that. Yeah, it's a 2023 Indy XC850. So 137. Yeah. It's, In uh, Canada colors as well. Right. Yeah, it, it's a good looking same color. Color, Same color as uh, a Sousa side by side that he used to have. It's Pro R. I think we put about 10 miles on it so far, just riding it around in the in the grass, everybody getting amped on it. So it's going to be cool. Yeah, yeah the pressure's high this snow. year. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully you guys also wrap up the challenge before all the snow goes away so whoever actually wins it can ride it this year. It's just going to be parked <laughs> all summer at the shop. I know, I know. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the challenges on these ones will probably go out into mid-February. Uh, so we have uh, a number of challenges scheduled out, a couple of trips. Um, and it's all leading nice. up to a pretty big finale that I don't want to say quite what it is just yet, but it's going to be much more exciting than last year. So, so you guys are going to come up to lodge sessions then, is what you're saying, Sudbury, <laughs> on, Ontario. That's you never know. That's how ten of them disappeared overnight. <laughs> <laughs> We do have a we have a lot of snowmobiling stuff planned for this winter. Everybody had such a good time with it last year, and the content worked well for us. So we've got a number of sledding trips lined up already. Yeah, you know it's good cool. for you guys as well because it keeps your channel rolling through the winter. Because I mean, I imagine it's got to be a pain because if you want to go ride anywhere, like I know you did the snow re the snow orienteering as you guys called it those yeah. couple of years. Those uh, for those who are watching the stream that have not seen those video, go look up on their channel the videos where they go and camp at minus forty. Uh, to give you an oh. idea, Dad, it was the same weekend that we were in Kirkland Lake, and it was minus 45. That was that same weekend they were up. I think you guys were in the UP doing that with uh, Austin Cruiser and uh, Cletus. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> I seen that. Yeah. yeah. That was that. <laughs> those are some pretty entertaining stuff. But, yeah, like I could imagine because you guys would be trailering down south if you want to ride your side-by-sides in something that isn't snow. Uh, so yeah. it's probably really easy on you guys just to do snowmobile stuff, right? It works out well. It's tough around here. When we have a good winter and the lakes and the rivers freeze up, the side-by-side -side stuff, you can do a lot of content with still. Um, you know, especially our local rivers, when they freeze up well and you can rip a frozen river on a side-by-side, -side, it's a great time. But uh, That would be wild. When you have kind of one of those in-between winters where we don't have a lot of snow, everything's not frozen up, um, generally we have to trailer north, and we're pretty big advocates of – kind of letting people have their season in the trails so we can take the side-by-sides up north and ride them there's you know dual use trails um but especially me as a snowmobiler you know i recognize sometimes 
you're out there tearing them up and rutting the trails up. It's not really the best for the snowmobile group. So we try to kind of leave the trails be for the sledders during their short season. So the snowmobile stuff works out great for us. We can kind of keep everybody happy and yeah. work around. Yeah, we, don't, the we, don't, we don't have that in Ontario because all of our trails um, in Ontario, you, it's only snowmobiles. And some of the systems are shared between summer and winter, but usually like um, they'll flip like November. That's the cutoff for the ATVs. And they start again first week of April, right? Like yep. That's how they kind of run it here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess that's a good point that you guys can still, but uh, we we're have in, more uh, and more. Also, it's got, well, it's got to be tough for you if you got you know twenty twelve Apex sitting in your garage. It's like, man, I don't want to be driving my side by side. I don't want to be out ripping that thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So yeah, I'm especially happy because I get to do more sledding again now, and we can make content out of it. So it's working out great for me. Yeah, you, you should come up to Quebec because they got. Uh, um, trails that run alongside the sled trails, but there, there's blocks between them. So a tree line or something like that. And I've never seen so many side-by-sides on in the winter time as I did when we were in Quebec last year. It was, it was okay. something to see. There's a couple where they actually come over and they, they use this sled trail, but I think it's maybe because they're drifting a corner or something, but uh, sure. pretty cool to see it. Like, and that's when it hit me that, that, yeah, you'd probably do way more in a side-by-side -side than you would, on an ATV if you actually own one and you really want to travel with it. For sure. Yeah. I mean, they give you a lot of confidence being inside that cage and also the ability to enclose them, put heaters in them, air conditioning, you know, street legal them in some cases, they're pretty darn flexible, which definitely adds a lot to their popularity. It's easy to get into and you can use them year round all over the place. Yeah, actually, throwing sparks says, "Have you got any experience with track kits for side by sides?" <sighs> yeah, broken a lot of them. <laughs> we've we've had a number of track kits, and uh, I shouldn't say that we uh, have had a couple Polaris builds where we use tracks that were designed for a much smaller machine. We put them on heavy, high horsepower stuff, tore them up, got stranded in the woods, yada yada. Uh, we've had a set of Can-Am tracks that work pretty darn well and we haven't busted them up. The issue with most of them is the drivers are so small, um, that you just have no gearing, you know, they're cool looking and they'll go places and they're fun, but it just makes the machine so dang slow. It doesn't <laughs> really fit for us so well. You know, we take a 300 horsepower machine and then only go 45 because you're geared so low. So we don't do a ton with the tracks. There's a couple ideas for this year. We might do a little bit, but. Very cool. Well, that's the thing. It's a, do, do you find that you're, you're, you're kind of pigeonholed for content that you have to actually kind of make something that's, that could possibly get destroyed or, or is way over the top just for the sake of views? At times, for sure. That's a, that's a real thing. Um, you know, sometimes things get destroyed a little bit or treated a little worse than you normally would in the name of entertainment. Um, sometimes you don't really get the time to really invest in a particular project like you'd like to, cause you got to bash it out. You got to do some videos with it and then you got to move on to the next thing. So it, uh, in general, what we're doing is stuff that we want to do and we're excited about, um, because if you're not, it doesn't work for content. No, but there's definitely a little piece of, you know, okay, we got to get through this quick or, you know, we need to be a little more wild with this. So the video is entertaining. I mean, that's, it's real. Yeah. And, and do, do you guys all have like careers and jobs or is this a full-time gig for you guys? <laughs> uh, for six of us, it's full-time now. And then uh, our guy, nice. Nick Seuss, I say part-time because he still runs another family business, but yeah, for everybody else, we're all full-time here. Right on. That's great. Congrats. What a, That's a what good a milestone. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doing what you love. Holy crap. Yeah. yeah. And it started, it started in your garage and then how did it develop from there? Like where did you, as far as shops go, like your shop right now is pretty killer. Yeah. The shop here is crazy. So, yeah, it started, uh, it started just in my, it was my parents' garage, um, which is basically a two-car garage. And I, you know, it was set up pretty well because I did a lot of work out there. Um, 
But as the channel grew and we wanted to take on bigger projects, we realized I couldn't do any sort of real long-term builds in that space, right? If I want to do an engine swap or some big build, I can't tie up the garage for months because we need to keep the content flowing. So we need a bigger shop. Um, and we were making enough money that it justified going out and getting a dedicated shop for it, which was gosh, 2019, 2020, something like that. We got a 4,000 square foot shop, which was pretty wild. Uh, all yeah. things can, considered for something that just started off as a, as a little hobby. And then, uh, yeah, things kept growing. And that first shop we were in, we, uh, outgrew our welcome <laughs> a bit. It was getting too small for us, but also the whole area was growing up. It was an industrial compound and, uh, new tenants were moving in and our kind of antics weren't really fitting in super well. So we had to make <laughs> the another drag, move. The drag Weird. racing in the park a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, we got away with that for longer than I expected to, honestly. And uh, yeah, now this new shop is wild. It's four buildings, 32,000 square feet. We're on 14 acres. It's a, it's a compound at this point. And you've got a track nope. that you built there. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Yep. Yep, we've got a yeah. track. We've uh, <laughs> there's a there's a lot here. Honestly, when I step back and look at it as a whole, it feels crazy that we've gotten where we are from this little just hobby YouTube channel we started. Yeah, it's pretty just, wild. The only I, thing you're missing from the old shop is the McDonald's drive-thru at quick access. There was nothing better than you guys finishing a build and ripping it through the drive-thru. The, the two-stroke. The two stroke X3 video where you have to, or Steve gets out and has to pull start it to start it again is one of the funniest <laughs> things I've ever seen. It's like, that oh my gosh. Fun. That was fun, but not being next to McDonald's is the best thing that's ever happened to any of us. That was <laughs> really bad. We actually cook food for ourselves now, you know, and eat halfway oh, healthy. <laughs> yeah. Greg says the look on Nick's racing. face when he pulled out his 94 Thundercat was hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> I, still, I can't believe he bought himself a triple triple Thundercat, but he's well, gonna that's what I love. I love it because he was totally new to snowmobiling. The the very first challenge you had, like he was yep. the guy that never never had done anything like this before. And then and then when he unveiled that one, the Thundercat, I'm going, holy crap! He doubled <laughs> down. <laughs> that's uh that's part of the deal when we send everybody out to get these sleds you know there's really no discussion about who's getting what or what we're looking at it's all this big secret so you know for a guy like him who hasn't been in the sport forever and doesn't really know these these sleds he doesn't have much for guidance he's out there on his own and winds up with a 94 thundercat he just wanted the biggest and baddest to eat. <laughs> I think he got it. That's how he rolls, uh, though, with all this. How stuff, did you right? get him into the shop? Like, did you tell everybody to leave and, you know, Nick would bring his in and then cover it up and then you'd all, he'd leave. And then is that how it worked? Basically, basically, yeah. When they're coming in, you know, they'd message the group and say, hey, I'm five minutes away with my sled. Everybody stay inside. We throw it under a tarp in another building and then uh, same deal moving them into the main shop everybody go in the other room and one by one we'd move them in tarp them so it was all did, all did, legit nobody had any idea what anybody else had bought That's awesome. so even you didn't know like did you does does anybody have any inc inc inkling at all and no the i guess the only one uh matt knew what i bought because he messaged the guy i bought it from two hours afterwards and the guy said it was sold. He told him how much it was sold for. And Matt, you know, knew that I snagged that <laughs> one. But. Yeah, I heard that. As you say that in the video, there's a couple of them like that. It's yeah. like, and yeah, it's, it's great someone... because the anticipation that builds in the shop, because we give generally a week or week and a half to go find yourself a sled. And the anticipation that builds in that week is out of control. We're all dying to see what everybody's bought by the time we get there. It's very fun. Now, when he said that someone that, that you had already bought or someone had already bought that sled, did did was the smack talk and started then or did he keep it a secret that he knew? No, Matt Matt kept it cool. He didn't he didn't say too much, but afterwards he you know he told me that he knew what I got the whole time. So, you know, he didn't out me to anybody, but that's the smack funny. talk has started now though. There's a lot of trash talk happening all all the time. <laughs> 
one oh. question that that never got answered in the video the one video was uh um, mike and matt are brothers but <laughs> i think nick was trying to figure out who the older one was and <laughs> Uh, I don't, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to do here because Mike, <laughs> Mike and Matt are not brothers, <laughs> but oh, we've been, no, but we've been running this joke long enough that a fair number of people believe that they actually are. And we're, we're oh, just going to continue. There was, a, there was a thread on your side by side blog universe, Facebook thing about it and there was like this story about them being separated at birth and i don't know if that was a friend of yours that also knows about the joke but i was like they they, they oh yeah it was separated at birth and they lived on the same block yeah <laughs> that was, oh that's funny that was people, one of the things on the thread <laughs> people come up with that all on their own and it's very funny to watch those comments because somebody brought it up they said well why do they have different last names and you know nobody picks up on it so We'll keep running. Oh, you need separated at so birth. the next shirt drop, you have to have separated at birth shirts. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's a good one. Bro brothers in arms with the two uh, sleds, the same sleds on them or something. When you do, yeah. Mike is like Mike is actually older though to answer your question, but they're not brothers. <laughs> they're, yeah, that's funny. Well, they they actually do look the same. I'm thinking they can't be brothers because they wouldn't have the same beard, you know, that type of thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of uh, of bodily hair, when did when and why did you shave your mullet or cut your mullet oh. off? My hair's been all over the place, and so that mullet was actually for a uh, lay mullets race at Cletus McFarland's. You know, the name of the race is lay mullets. We thought it was a funny thing. I'll get the chops going. I'll get the mullet going, and uh, had fun with it. Ripped it for a while. Decided it wasn't exactly my personality long term, so <laughs> cleaned it up a little bit, but. You know, we're yeah, we're having a good time all the time, and I don't often have to be overly professional, so I can get away with that stuff every once in a while. But yeah, so you, uh, what's what's the you know you have lots of accolades and lots of great things happening on the channel. What did you, is, is there anything that really jumps out in your memory as being a real milestone or fond memory? There's. <sighs> There's honestly so many. Um, we've been in so many situations where we've looked at each other and asked ourselves, like, how did we get here? You know, over and over, whether it's just, uh, you know, meeting people that are big in various industries or racing with people you'd never thought we'd be on a track with, becoming friends with people we never thought we'd become friends with. There's an endless number of those things at this point. Um, Probably like a huge turning point for us was 2017. We got invited to go down to the Baja 1000 um, and essentially be a chase team, run pit crew for a uh, pro side-by-side -side team. And uh, that was something I always wanted to experience, kind of a dream thing. Didn't really see an avenue to ever actually go down there and be a part of it. It's even for us, it's you know, all the way on the other side of the country, very difficult thing to do. And we were able to go do that. And that experience was not to be dramatic, but honestly, life-changing. You know, that was the point in time after we'd done that race, we, you know, got through the race, succeeded, took second, up for 50 hours straight, just a, a tall stack of crazy experiences over the course of those few days. And at that point, we looked at each other and went, man, this is, you know, this is something special. We're getting, this is getting us to places where we can do things that we likely wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And that was kind of the turning point to decide to go all in on it. Um, and since then, there's just been experience after experience that's been like that. It's pretty blessed to have done a lot of the things we've done. That's cool. Where did the guys come together from? Like, are, were you were you childhood buddies or you said Nick's from California? So how did you guys all meet and how did it all come together? Yeah, we kind of just all met through the, the sport. I shouldn't say we all met. The first few of us just met through the sport. Um, you know, Nick Seuss, for instance, had a mutual friend who had a mutual friend that knew Nick Seuss and said, hey, I got this guy that bought this side by side doesn't have anybody to ride with I said okay come ride with us and then you know nick sue shows up to the trailhead 
one day just to tag along and become some of the best of friends and you, know, you let him come here. back after you met yeah. him. <laughs> crazy right that was so it was so funny i remember sitting in the trailhead that day waiting for this guy nick who we'd never met before and he comes rolling down the dirt road in this lowered tahoe on 26s you know, jumps out with his gold chains and we're just laughing, thinking, who in the world is this guy? Turns out best dude ever been friends since. But um, some of the guys, our guy, Mike, you know, I've known. I can't remember when I didn't know him, been friends forever. Obviously, my brother, you know, is part of the crew. Our guy, Justin, um, basically was a fan who was also an electrician. We needed some electrical work done. He started working around here, helping us. We brought him on full time. So it's a mix. Right Just people randomly coming together. Now, are you, are you a mechanic or do you guys like, a, like, do you just learn the tinkering and maintenance of these things on your, uh, by trial and error or uh, are, are, are a few of you guys really um, qualified to, uh, <laughs> to, to do a lot of this work? That's a no, nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a... well, when you put a Hellcat into a CF Moto, I want to know what kind of. <laughs> there are some real qualifications mixed in, actually. So uh, Matt in particular, is uh, he's a certified master mechanic. Uh, my brother, Steve, is a mechanical engineer. Um, I am a mechanical engineer. So I did automotive product engineer for nine years before I went full time. Um, before that, um, I was a CNC machinist. I worked in fabrication. So there's some real background, you know, what comes out on the internet sometimes is a bunch of goofy guys just messing around, slapping stuff together. But there's, there's some actual qualification backing some of this stuff, you know? Well, I, I know it's not slapped together because you can tell by the quality, like when you're attaching roll cages and things like that, like you can tell there's attention to detail and there's some thought and design going into it although you don't show that part it's uh, uh i knew there was something else there and um you know i i was just curious of how how you can go from you know just just being uh an owner of a side-by-side -side, but and then putting in like a you know an 800 triple or a or a hellcat engine in one you know and and where where does that come from like like how do you how do you get to that that spot? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's a uh, a lot of that type of stuff is you know at least for me and for my brother you know stuff we were doing long before the side by sides, and uh, a lot of these guys. Matt's a car guy, always worked on cars. Uh, Mike's the same way, always working on trucks. You know we were into this type of stuff long before the side by side thing came around, and. Uh, you know, I've got other things that are engine swapped. It's just gearheads. You know, we just yeah. You got a you got a sweet uh, sweet truck that's been shown on the garage channel a few times when you dug it out of your uh, the one barn and you were trying to like cold start after the first time in like ten years. I think sweet. What's that? A seventy nine Ford? Oh yep, yep, yep. That's a seventy nine Ford. That was my first ever truck. You know, handed down from my dad. Right. Turned it into a mud truck. Turned it into a dune truck it's got a big block on nitrous and all that sort of stuff you know so it's just sort of in the blood we've just been modifying things and adding horsepower to things until we ruin them basically for <laughs> forever that's been the cycle yeah that's right. Ru ruin rinse and repeat kind of thing right? <laughs> pretty much pretty much <laughs> that's cool where do you think you want to go with the with the channel moving forward? Like, where do you where do you see side by side blog heading? Ideally, um, doing something similar for just as long as we can. Uh, we have a great time here. You know, everybody really appreciates being able to spend so much time on stuff they like to do, and not that it's all fun all the time, right? It's still very much a pretty large business in the background. And there's a lot of work that isn't necessarily fun, but we want to do this for as long as possible. And I think, you know, changes will have to occur to make that possible. We'll probably, and we've already started doing this, but we'll probably start to expand our content, you know, even more to grab new audiences and keep things diverse and keep things exciting. Um, 
so I see it's expanding in more into other power sports and probably dabbling in automotive stuff more. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're just going to try to keep keep ripping it, just keep having a good time. And as long as we can make enough money to pay the bills on it, we'll keep doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you, do you see electric being in your future or uh, or what's your opinion on on electric? <sighs> Maybe, you know, we have a couple of concepts for electric builds, right? Because everybody wants to see a Tesla swap or this swap or that swap. And um, Matt and my brother in particular are both very good with that type of stuff. So it's something we've explored. I think nobody here is like really super passionate about it, honestly. You know, we all love the loud noises. Like I'm a very big internal combustion engine guy, huge fan. Uh, I appreciate electric and what it does and the performance metrics and the potential of it and all those things. I don't look down on it, but it's just not that exciting to me. So we'll do it at some point, but I don't think it's going to be a primary road for us. Not something that we're going to focus on heavily until we have to, until that's what everybody's yeah. thinking. But. Well, and there, there already is a Tesla swap project that uh, um, the Diesel Brothers had on their channel there. And yeah. um, you kind of want to be first to market on something like that, I, I'd imagine, unless you did something really crazy with it. What what would you say your craziest build that you, you recall would be? I think personally, um, so our 2JP machine, we call it 2JP. It's a Polaris Razor uh, Turbo S four-seater uh, with a 2JZ Toyota Super engine in it. Um, and it's an all-billet engine, stroker, power glide, big turbo. It makes a little over 1,300 horsepower at the crank. I've been 170 in it. That one, in my mind, is still the craziest thing. Um more recently, that build we did with the CF Moto, putting the Hellcat Demon engine in it, you know, that one's very rowdy as well. But 2J is just so fast. And the experience exactly. of being in that thing is so radical. That one's still at the top of the list for me. Yeah. And you, you were trying to get over 180 in that thing. Uh, has that, has that happened off the, you know, unpublished yet or not yet? Um, It'll absolutely do it, but I need to do a little aero on it. So right now it starts to fail aerodynamically at about 160, 165. Um, I can feel the front end get light. It takes way more steering input than it should to make it move. So at some point, it's got plenty of power and plenty of gear. It'll go 200 plus, no problem. Um, but I think at some point we'll probably actually put it in a wind tunnel and make a few changes to make sure we can keep it planted and it doesn't try to turn into an airplane on us and then i'll go faster but for now 170 yeah. is still the number you mean the yeah, engineers so at polaris in 2016 <laughs> didn't design or 2018 didn't design their four seat to do 200 miles an hour <laughs> i guess not i don't know what Dang they were it. thinking but <laughs> oversights and engineering gosh so, We'll do it eventually. I'm kind. Of, I'm still leaning on having the side by side top speed record. If somebody else gets close to it, then you know we'll pull that thing back out and do some arrow. And I think it needs more, more horsepower. <laughs> and and who does your? Do you, do you guys build your own engine? Like when you when you took that two JZ engine and and uh, and totally flushed that thing out? Did, did did your guys do it or did you send that to a shop? That one we didn't do. So most of the engine build stuff we do, uh, we do in-house and I do primarily. Um, but with the Supra engine, we had a guy that was a fan. His name's Don and he runs a performance shop called Accelerated Performance out of Ohio, a couple miles uh, or a couple hours south of us. And he's essentially a world renowned 2JZ engine builder. He's, you know, building top of the line engines that are being shipped all over the world and uh he offered to be a part of it and to take on the build and help with sponsorship and cover all the labor and when a guy like that reaches out and wants to help you don't say no so he nice. uh, yeah so we've been through two engines in that one because i blew the first one in two pieces um but yeah he's uh taking on the 2j build for us 
that that's nice outdoor hobby guy he said uh, i know you talked about riding in the snow but he's curious if you guys have ridden much side by side in the snow um you have but what do you do you do anything different to the side by side before you go out in the snow or you guys just rip it we don't really we just tend to send them for the most part you know our uh in general our preparation for trips is pretty poor like We'll make sure everybody has clothes and we have some tools. But other than that, we're just getting in the machines and ripping. So if we go on a snow ride around here, generally we're not talking feet of snow. Um, we just get in them and put warm clothes on and send them. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you put studs in the, in the rubber or anything like that. Uh, it'd be neat to see you guys out on the ice in them. That's for sure we've we have done that a couple of times we've been out on some frozen ponds where we've studded up some sets of tires but you know that's more of a special occasion thing okay one day we're gonna go spend the day on the ice so we'll stud up some sets but for general riding we typically just take them out just like they are you know maybe throw a windshield on if we got one but yeah right on right on talk to us about the hell force uh you've had that thing on the uh, in the burnout the burnout pits at Cletus McFarland's track. You've had it in the sand dunes. Um, uh, give us some more detail and insight. We've got some pictures of this thing coming up. Um, so don't, don't release too much of it, but I'll, uh, when we get into the pictures, I want to hear more about that, but tell us about how that project came to be. Oh my gosh. So <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a very funny one. Um, so CF moto, of course, you guys made note of we've, been doing a little bit more with them recently. Um, and I, I honestly, I, I like what they're doing over there. They've moved a lot of their engineering and design team to the States. So a lot of their future stuff is going to be worked on, you know, by people in the area. Um, they're doing the right things looking forward. So started having some discussions with them and they started asking us what, you know, we could do with a CF moto that would be cool. And, uh, you know, we were honest about it and said, boy, that's kind of a tough one. I uh, can't really think of a whole lot. If you guys want to do something cool, though, sort of jokingly, give us one of these U-Force XLs. We'll put a Hellcat engine in it and do burnouts. And it was it was almost a joke. And then they went, yeah, OK, no problem. <laughs> Let's do it. So <laughs> it turned into a real thing just like that. And uh, they helped us out with a machine. And uh, the machine showed up and I went, boy, now I got to actually figure out how to do this. Because when we discussed it, I hadn't put a tape measure on anything. You know, it was just kind of a kind of a concept. And then it became real and we made her work. Turned out great. Thing rips burnouts. How, how much of a how much of a uh, of a of a CF moto is left in there? Is it is it all a custom chassis or is it 90 percent CF moto or? There's a there's a lot of CF Moto chassis left. So from uh, the B pillar forward is all OEM CF Moto. Nice. Um, and then behind that, I kind of say I back halved it. So at the back of the rear seats, I chopped the whole stock chassis off, and then uh, we ended up using a Mustang S550 subframe. And then I built a chassis to that. So I sort of built a chassis around the engine trans and subframe and then inserted it and attached it to the back of the car. So I'll say uh, probably 85% of the stock chassis is still there. And then I That's just added awesome. to it. Yeah. Very cool. And it, it needs a little bit of work to get it dune, uh, you know, capable in the dunes. Have you done anything to, to kind of fix that? I, you know, I haven't. It, that's one of those things where to take it in the dunes would have been a whole different build right from the start. And that's that's always a struggle with those types of things around here. You build it for a purpose and then somebody goes, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we used it for something way different than its purpose? And I say, yeah, that would be fun. Let's try it. And it doesn't work. You know, so uh no, right now, I mean, that thing's got like four inches of wheel travel because it's meant, you know, for flat surfaces and to do burnouts and not have body roll and to go fast and all those things. So, 
uh, we bent the shock mounts up and we took it out in the dunes. And when I rebuilt them, I made them a little stronger, but I didn't go crazy on purpose. So it'll get some off-road duty, but that one's not going to be slamming through four foot whoops <laughs> anytime. No, soon. no. It, it ripped the wall of China though, man. Holy crap. Like that's, uh, that's yep. incredible for a utility quad and it's so short and small. Like, is it sketchy to drive? Like, is it real jittery? No, it drives almost unreasonably well, unreasonably well. So I think I've had it probably, and we don't have a speedometer in it, but uh, just based on gear and RPM, I've been in probably 130, 135 in that. And it just cruises <laughs> down the road. Like You could be one hand on the wheel. It's miles almost, an hour, folks. Miles an hour for the yeah. Canadian viewers. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know the conversion off the top of my head, but... Uh, 1.6. 1.6 to 1, right? Yeah. 180, 190K? No but yeah, it's, uh, surprisingly good, actually. Rob, Rob, the oil guy, wants to know what you did with the rest of the Hellcat. <laughs> I wish I had the rest of the Hellcat. Unfortunately, we just bought the crate engine brand new with the wiring harness, and uh, it was way too much money. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to have the rest of the car to offset that a little bit, but yeah, that's right. Swap it back and forth, right? Right, right. Make some yeah, release for sure. Maybe. That's cool. Listen, do you want to get in and see some viewer photos, and then we'll get into more photos of yours? Yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Let's get this rock and uh, I'm just going to call up my fast track stuff and away we go. Fan photos are brought to you by Fast Track Snowmobile Traction. This season, quit sliding sideways on the ice and losing races to your buddies. A Fast Track stud kit will help you with improved braking and give you the arm ripping acceleration you crave. I put over 3,000 clicks last season on my Renegade 850 and I'll tell you these studs exceeded my expectations. Not one broken stud, my idle wheels still look like new, and they hooked up like I was on rails in the twisties, inspiring confidence every ride. Fast Track Top Gun kits are the highest rated stud kit at 4.9 stars with over 230 reviews. The studs are heat treated stainless so they are strong and they don't rust. The kit is lighter, easier on the track, and has a lifetime warranty against braking. Each kit comes with a track specific template for complete balance with over double the scratch lines from stock templates. All listeners when purchasing a stud kit can get a free install kit, a $30 value. Visit FastTrack.co, add both products to the cart and use the coupon code SNOW at the checkout. That's F-A-S-T-T-R-A-C.co. Right on. I think we lost Drew there. Yeah, he's gone. Uh, yeah, he is. <laughs> That's his apartment building there in uh, in the city of Windsor. So he's uh, probably yeah, just I'm had to go get another view. That's cool. Yeah, those are uh, those are his Wii guitars on the wall. But he's got a he's got a um, he'll be able to explain to you what what he's got. He's got a Fender bass, and that's an Ibanez uh, Steve whoa, whoa, Vai edition. Did, did, okay. did I hear Fender bass? Now hold on, that is a. It's a 1994 Ibanez TRB50, rare and Olympic white. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, is that what that one is? I thought it was a Fender. No, you had a Ibanez. Fender at one point. Oh, yeah, there it is. And uh, the uh, I think he had a Fender at one point in time, but and then that's the Ibanez there, Steve okay. Vai edition. My baby, so, my I baby. Like it. I like yeah. it. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so he's a really good drummer, but the as you can see. When he went to university, he had to sell his uh, his drum kit because there's no way to to play it in a dorm. And then this year, when he got his own apartment, he went out and bought a uh, he bought Amazon shows up when he's coming home here one weekend, and he's got an electric drum kit on the porch. It's like, oh, that's <laughs> that's interesting. That's how the, how does that work? We've got an electric drum kit in the shop right now because our guy Seuss is actually a very good drummer as well. He used to be in a metal band, so he rips it pretty good. Hell yeah, that's oh, cool. Drew, we got to get cool. So when when is when's Drew and I invited down there to bring the Wolverine down to open invite but, anytime you guys want. Anytime you guys want. Cheap the cheap ATV I'm not too far. challenge. I'm not too far. Yeah. No. Yeah, if you're the in cheap Windsor, ATV not challenge, too far we'll go. Yeah, so anyway, I think I was telling you Doug that that I wanted Drew on here because when I when when him and his buddies hang out, 
it's it's like the guys from side by side blog but years earlier and you know this is this is the, him on the cheap <laughs> oh, call oh yeah <laughs> no no Chevy sprints were in, <laughs> injured in the Abio, making of Abio. This video. that's a Chevy Abio Ab is it a 2004 thing was meant <laughs> until we until we forgot that automatic transmissions have breather tubes we drove it through so much water it just rotted the transmission from the inside out it's oh, fine yeah. though it's we've got they my buddy Cole got 500 bucks for it. So it totally fine. <laughs> that thing was so I much fun. I, it only had it reverse though. When you guys... <laughs> oh, yeah, by the time we were done with it, it would click reverse. And we were in it in the middle of winter to try to get it out. Like when we were home from school and I remember putting it in reverse, it moved like a little bit. And then it was just right to the red. And then every single thing was a neutral. But yeah, the thing was fun. We cut, the, we cut the exhaust right off it on like the first day. <laughs> um, I we took one of the headlights out and then I drilled holes in the air box and I was like, it's a Hellcat, like where you have like the air intake on the headlight side. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that works for sure. Oh, for it was sure. so much fun, but yeah, that, took was all the interior. that day was a riot when I had the oh, we take the interior because I was sitting in the back of their farm for like two years and a rat, rat, and mice <laughs> got in it. And you know what happens when that so we took we ripped the headliner out of it, stripped the interior. I think all it had at the end was a driver and passenger seat. Um, and then everything else we just junked. Uh, yeah, it was it was a fun time. We but that's, yeah, for, for like an a 85, 90 horsepower car that we just were allowed to take from their parents just to beat on. I remember I found the ownership and the insurance and I gave it to the dad. I'm like, yeah, we're not gonna be needing this, just take that. <laughs> yeah, we may got in trouble, we may got in trouble yeah. from the grandparent that owns the farm when I took it down the road for a top speed test on the first day we had it. That's when it was a little more safe. That's before we sheared both tie rods um, in the sway bars. Was just, the sway bar lengths were just... Yeah, they were get you. Ride. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I go on for yeah, so There's $800 Wolverine doing some doing what it does best. I like that know. Wolverine. You know, if you guys are going to get rid of that, hit me up. No. I like that machine. No. It's, it's, sorry. It's, 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 you know. Do you guys have side-by-side -side blog tax? Sadly, we have Mud Brats tax. It's, it's a $6,000 <laughs> yeah, U.S. unit. Oh you know, yeah, that's, that's right. yeah, that's a little rough. We'll we'll negotiate offline. We'll take that off. We'd have to. Yeah. We'll have to get it when we bring it down to to do the cheap ATV challenge, and uh, you can we can talk turkey then. All right. If, all right, you, all if right. you name if you name yeah. your your new side by side uh, Goldfinger, then yeah. we can talk about it. Goldfinger. <laughs> all right. I'll name it whatever you guys want if I get that Wolverine. <laughs> They're great. You gotta, They're say, great I love, you gotta say I love gold at the start of every single episode, though, is the only <laughs> okay. Okay. I could see that being fun for a few weeks, but <laughs> yeah. Paul Malou was a he's a teacher, he's a high school teacher in Sudbury, Ontario. And we had him on the podcast. He's part of the Sudbury Trail Plan. And one of the things, Doug, that he does is he um he really gets the kids involved in snowmobiling. Like they go out and they help with trails and he, they all like because it's such a snow belt area they'll ride their sleds to school so that he actually organized a trip with all the kids on their sleds and he took them out and they did a big ride and had had a barbecue lunch and learn about nature and stuff out there and and uh amazing guy and the, and what he's doing with the the uh his students is something that i don't think is i've never heard of it and it's more valuable than anything they're ever going to learn in a classroom, I think. So he sent me in a couple of photos. He said, here's a couple of pictures if you want for your show. This year, we're building an asphalt drag sled with our grades 7 to 12 students at the high school I work at. 120 students have already helped with the disassembly. It's a 2000 Polaris XCR 800. We just dropped off the engine at I Ian Tomasi Racing. We're shooting for 225 to 230 horsepower and compete in the one eighth mile in hopefully under six seconds. Isn't that crazy. That <laughs> we'll be bringing awesome. student. Yeah, isn't that cool? We will be bringing students to Jerry's shop when the engine is complete, so they can check out the operation and to see what kind of numbers our engine gets on the dyno. The goal of the project is to prom promote skilled trades to the students, teach students how to work on and maintain their sleds and teach students where and how to race their sleds safely as opposed to on the trails. I will be the driver. We're partnering with the Greater Sudbury Police Service, Ian Tomasi Racing, 
Manitoulin Chrysler and Algoma Chrysler. We're also lucky enough to have a lot of individuals from the snowmobile racing community supporting the project with donations. Work will continue through the winter and early spring, hoping to make its debut late spring at the drag strip in Bondsfield. He said, thanks again, Paul. Isn't that wild? Man, my auto shop class sucked. <laughs> no, I mean, anymore you're lucky to have an auto shop class. So that yeah, is that yeah, is really. Very that's cool. a good point. But that's that's a guy who's doing it right. Yeah, there's yeah. there's so much good about that. I mean, there's so much quality oh, learning so cool. happening there, especially in these times where getting younger people into motorsports or power sports or doing anything outdoors as opposed to the alternatives, not to talk down on video games, but it's uh, extremely important for the future of all of this stuff. So that's awesome to see. Very cool. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know what he did? He does a, um, uh, a thing in his classroom where he gets the OPP to come in. He had vendors like Koala Pieces Carbides and, and people like that come in and talk to the students and the students all ask questions. He had safety kits put out and man, he's like this guy, he's doing it right. So that was a sled back here. If I go back, uh, fully assembled. And then you can see here, it, it takes a, uh, it takes a different form as the, the girls get in there with their tools. One's got the wiring harness out of it. You know, here's the boys taking the seat off. You can see there, it's already stripped down to almost nothing. Where'd they find you know. an XCR that was that clean? That thing is like <laughs> mint condition. <laughs> I was you thinking th the think same thing. <laughs> like, looks like it just rolled <laughs> off the showroom. I don't even know. Some yeah. Well, yeah, they had the engine there. The engine looked in really good shape. So I think they might have paid more than fifteen hundred for it. I'm not sure. <laughs> he should have. Uh, he oh, should he have uh, let in on that, cool. right? Yeah. So very cool. Brad Brad Bender sent in this picture. He says, "Hey Gary, I love last week's episode." Uh, notice the fan photos were a little on the light side. I thought I'd contribute. Oh, yeah, I got to put the banner up. If you guys need to uh, want your photos um, featured on this show, make sure you get them in by Monday at noon and uh, and send them to fanphoto at mudbrats.com. Fanphoto at mudbrats.com and, uh, and give us a little story like this. So he said this is the team. He said the truck was unable to, to get the trailer out of the cottage lane so we uh, hooked it up to the team and dragged the trailer up the road you can see it's it's attached to both the 900 turbo and the uh, the yamaha there now i think the yamaha is probably there for balance i think the 900 turbo is probably doing most of the pulling there <laughs> you don't think that phaser's doing it come on man uh, no i'm gonna have to give it to the 180 horsepower sled on the right there no. <laughs> don't uh, don't right, underestimate funny. a phaser don't never underestimate a phaser I'm just saying horses. when we're comparing these two, maybe maybe if, you know, yeah. if I was on a 377 Safari, I, don't, I wouldn't underestimate the phaser. You know, that's right. Yeah. It's, it's context. It's context. Yeah. I wish we had enough oh. snow for that to be a problem. That's a good problem to have right there. It is for sure. This what was this? Yeah, was this, this from this year? Or was that from last year? The guy sent that in last season for sure. Last oh, okay. Season. I didn't hear that. Okay. Right. I was about to say. Yeah, it's you like, can send in old. Yeah, and I don't care it? what pictures you send in. You can send in pictures from when you're. 10 years old, your first sled, your last sled, your next sled, your, you can send in other things. Uh, Mike Galit sends us dirt bike photos all the time. So um, I, it doesn't have to be uh, snowmobiles. It could be side-by-sides or anything you're working on, uh, even your trailer builds, you know. it's uh, I, Our fans all love it. So here, this is in Shakespeare, Ontario there, Drew. This is near Stratford on the trail between New Hamburg and Shakespeare. Support for truckers convoy in Ottawa. How effing Canadian does it get? <laughs> Let's not bring politics yeah. into this. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Right, sure, we can if you want to. I'm game. You're probably yeah, exactly. right. Though. We'll avoid it. We'll avoid it. Snow we'll billing is divided from... enough. Let's just keep moving. Good photo. Yeah. That's all right. That, that's an awesome yeah, area. That... We ride that trail all the time. Shakespeare, New Hamburg. We're always ripping down that trail. Yeah. I didn't see that, so that must have been last year, even maybe even the year before. Um, probably we when that ride, protest we didn't was ride on. that way actually this last year though, because we did no, like we didn't. remember the few rides we did home. We did the cowbell brewing, and we did uh, one of the other rides. You lost your cameras, lost. <laughs> yeah, I have you a guys problem. Ever have that? Even, 
Yeah, do you guys ever have that, Doug? You guys just lose footage? Like, we've lost, like, two rides that just miraculously have disappeared off hard drives. It's tough. <laughs> you oh, guys yeah. experience that a lot? Yeah, we've unfortunately a number of times had really good footage. Um, you know, a battery dies, the file gets mm -hmm. corrupted for whatever reason. We lost a hard drive at one point, and we've sent cards around and hard drives around trying to get them recovered. Didn't have any luck. So we've unfortunately lost some really good stuff over the years but we had an awesome one we lost this past season where we a buddy of ours uh links broke down after 30 kilometers and we towed it back across like a slushy lake and it was amazing footage from that day we caught a moose on the trail it was all on video and then dad goes to edit it a couple weeks later he can't find it we try we've tried yeah, everything totally gone it's tough. it, it yeah. was one of those ones i think i think there's some malware on the drive it's totally gone it's not even not even there to recover it's uh it's it's a there's a few rides but i made i did lose footage of one ride that i got deleted by mistake and uh i made a pack that man if i can only get the quebec ride back i'd do anything i'd give up any other ride that was before i did the other ones and uh sure enough that someone called the bluff on that one so um yeah yeah so there you go um this is abitibi canyon or Bidibi Canyon is a Wisconsin guys tell us, eh, Drew? Oh yeah. man, that was we're still little, on little that, rump eh? through yeah, a little romp through Abitibi Canyon with some friends. That's a good crew. Brad's coming on lodge sessions this year too, Drew. He's, He's the is this the same guy his... that sent the trailer photo with the 900? Yeah. The, so dude, this okay. is the guy that we ran into at the gas station in um Baden. Kirk that Baden. one time. Remember he came in, in a 900 turbo? We were, we were just pulling out of gas, and he came in. Uh, you don't sorry, remember no, a couple years ago? No. That was a couple, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I probably I, I, it's 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 probably just mushing with a bunch of other rides. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that that uh, that pro that's sitting there, the blue and blue and green. Much they did steal that color from Skidoo. Polaris did uh, good good yeah. choice stealing that color. Yeah, it's a good yeah. color scheme. Yeah, for and sure. Flash. And and this is up in Moosonee. It's a group group trip he took to Moosonee out of Smooth Rock Falls. And uh yeah, it's uh it's a uh, good good times and we're gonna have a hoot with him there. And then this is Mass Art. He sent in some pictures of this is um uh this guy, it's not this guy, I think it's his son's first sled that he bought brand new. Not his first sled, it's his first new sled, and it's a Lynx 850. Um and uh, they they actually got to go to seminar sports and put it together. They assembled it, and you can see they uh, they broke into seminar's beer fridge while they were there. Come on, not taste. <laughs> You'll have that. You'll have that. What yeah. a beautiful machine. Yeah, it is. That's coming. He actually, to launch he, he just said he he put it in the chat a little bit ago. He goes, Drew, I sent you a Snapchat, and I looked at it. He sent me a picture of his sled sitting next to that one, fully assembled, because he's still there doing nice. that right now. At seminar, but oh, yeah. po possibly. <laughs> yeah. And then oh, he ordered a helmet, helmet wrap, oh. and he got me to wrap his helmet. He ordered a helmet wrap from me, and uh, and uh, he he likes the retro sleds. He's got several old sleds, right up to brand new. And he said, "Can you do something with the mechanical B?" And this is what we come up with. So the uh, and he said, "Put your logo on the back there." So I did put the Mud Brats logo, Love and that. away we go. Very but, cool. Uh, Takes an ugly helmet, Doug, and it makes it nicer, you know? Yeah, when you can only get it plain, that, what are the colors? Plain black, red, and, and white now, I think, or burgundy and think, white. Right. I think I think so. Oh, and carbon. Yeah. But the, I, yeah, yeah, great helmet wraps. Yeah. Great job on that so, one. So, yeah, it's a, yeah, and he did a good job installing that, too. They're, they're not easy to install, that's for sure. So, here we go. There's my boy, Nick. Oh, Nick, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nick Seuss, first time snowmobiling. Oh, I love yeah. the Sending underlighting on that. I love the underlighting on it. I don't, I don't, I think you guys pointed out only like once, but like the underlighting that the previous yeah. are like blinged on the bottom, like the rock purple lights. underglow. Yeah. Oh man, that, that sled was a, a was a gem though. That was sitting outdoors, literally up on a stump, and uh, it was just great. It was just fine. <laughs> the whole challenge, it, you know, it looks off. clean, like it looks. It looks really good. Like it, it's yeah. uh, man, like the, the stuff, the, what you guys are buying these sleds for, you're just stealing them. You know, we've gotten some very good deals. No doubt. We get called out on that all the time. People think it's not real, but 
Oh boy, yeah. I recognize that but, picture. <laughs> but when you do that, when you do that, um, that sled challenge, like you you physically hand a pile of cash to the like you guys divvy up cash, but you yeah. physically have the cash, and that probably keeps people honest too, right? Like this is your budget. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the guys are all good, right? So there's there's definitely an honor system there. I don't think we've run into anybody actually overpaying for a sled and lying about it. But yeah, everybody gets the set amount of cash in an envelope and uh that's the deal. So if and they then cheat, who's the we're banker find when out. it comes time? Yeah, well, who's the banker when it comes time to you know what I gotta do service on this thing and I need to I need more money. Like, how does that work? So uh, Matt is kind of our guy that tracks all the points. So you have to report to him um, if you spent money on your sled. So, you know. With his little booklet. With his little exactly. booklet with all the ratty pages. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So we're taking this one so seriously. I mean, if you go buy a set of spark plugs, you got to go report to Matt how much you spent on the spark plugs so we can tally it all up at the end, but. Oh, there'll be there'll be bloodshed over that the 850. It's gonna you know get rough. I mean? when it comes, it's gotta it can't be close. Like it's gotta be something where there's a you know <laughs> when it comes time to actually race each other, I it's it's gonna get rowdy this year, I think, but it'll be a good We're time. Gonna, yeah, hopefully no one you know gets too too competitive though. We don't need to see any bent bent skis and broken arms or anything like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, well, that's good I think content. there's gonna be a little that's rubbing good. probably. Uh I think I think once I think once Seuss gets the prize in his head, you know, and the animal gets let out again, he's gonna get that vision when he jumped his pro R on the dunes when he just keeps going faster and faster. He might do something like that. He, he might, might get some carnage. When that guy flips the switch, you don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> Unreasonable That's things awesome. sometimes. So Unreasonable. <laughs> yeah. The uh, so what are we looking at here, Doug? Oh gosh, this is just uh I was pulling random old pictures and this was just one I enjoyed because it was kind of from the era that was really my core of being deep into snowmobiles. So that's me on the left, my dad to my right, and then my brother there in the green shirt. And this is just what we did every winter for years. We would trail ride a ton, you know, uh, and then uh, anytime there was a, an ice drag, you know, I was pretty heavy into that. So that's my ice drag sled. Uh, which I still have. It's in the shop right now. It uh, started as a 92 VMAX 4, and it's you know gone through a ton of changes, but it has a Turbo RX1 engine in it. And uh, that was just a picture of a great time. I love doing that stuff. This was a, just a loosely organized uh, grudge racing event, essentially. It wasn't sanctioned, but it happened every year. We called it the Fat Man Shootout. And uh, nice. all the big boy drag racers would show up and party on the ice and drag race all day. And that was the, the heyday of the sport for me, for sure. Yeah. Does your family still get involved? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> my mom and dad both still have snowmobiles, you know, obviously getting, getting older now. So not really riding nearly as much, but uh, you know, my brother's still into it. And a lot of my buddies outside of, the business and outside of side by side blog are still snowmobilers. So very cool. Hopefully we can see you on the snow more this winter. That'd be uh, neat, neat to see. I'm looking forward to that content. I think it's going to really open a lot of doors for you. Yeah. 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 That picture there, that's from that same day. I think I'm about the, that's a pro stock thousand, that black and red sled. I think I lost that race. I don't remember exactly, but I was, I was fighting with them. We were in there. Nice. Yeah, we had a hurricane performance on and he 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 basically takes sidewinders and makes them for snow and pavement. And, you know, he's pulling like how many horsepower did you say this one? This one had. I mean, that's an um, RX1 motor, right? Yeah. On that day, it was about 280. It sits about 400 now. Oh, so. that's amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry. 400 on a on a on a VMAX four chassis. Yeah. You're mental. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she gets good. Have you ever I done mean, it? It's escalated so far these days? 400 horsepower is barely even a lot anymore. But no, no, that's right. Well, that's the thing. When they start at 200, think of what you can squeeze out of them, right? Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, but yeah. That, the, my point yeah, is you, VMAX it, 4 didn't start at 200, right? Like, that's no, I know. Sidewinders, which, like, our buddy that comes to the ride with us, he's got that 280 horsepower. It's just a tune on it. That VMAX yeah. starts as a, yeah. you know, decently heavy four-cylinder two-stroke, and you throw friggin' turbo arcs one motor in it. Yeah, 400 horsepower, sure. It's probably one yeah. of the higher horsepower VMAX 4s out there, oh, I would guess. Gosh. Yeah, that's wicked. Have you ever done any asphalt drags on it? Um, not on that sled. We had a, uh, turbo RX one that we did some asphalt drags with for a year or two, not a whole heck of a lot, but did try it out a little bit, had some fun with it. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. It's a different mentality, right? Different track, probably different suspension setup to some degree, that type of thing. Yeah. The sled, uh, the sled that we took out was just a trail turbo RX one. It was my dad's sled. And didn't do a heck of a lot, honestly. Threw the skis on it, swapped the track, um, did a little bit of clutching, and just ran it for something to do in the summer. And, uh, you know, it was cool. It was going uh, nine sevens in the quarter mile at like 138 miles an hour. So, I mean, it, it ran out pretty good. But, uh, you know, at the time, not a lot of people were doing it. And it was uh, not a very quick paced format of racing so we did it a little here and there never got too serious into it but yeah are grass drags a thing down in your area they were um they're they're struggling a little bit now it's not as popular and kind of the same story with ice racing everybody's snow dragging these days so we might transition to that a little bit but uh you know unfortunately the grass drag scene could could use a little help it's uh not as popular as it was 10 15 years ago but yeah, uh, yeah. it's building back up in this area there's uh near ottawa they've uh, there's a crew out there trying to get the they put a grass proper grass track and they groom it properly um for grass drags and um she's doing a really good job of it i'm hoping to get her on the podcast to talk about it um but yeah they're they're making some real good inroads because it's a big thing right it's it's something yep. to do when the off season and it's uh, when it's done right, it's safe and it's fun. You know, it's a, it's a nice yep. outing. Yep. That's good. That's good. Yeah. The tips to the sky here. Oh yeah. As one of the few pictures I had of my latest, I mean, that's my newest sled. I bought that sled brand new and uh, still haven't, haven't gotten another new one since, but that sled it's uh, had a, pretty interesting first year of its life. It was the first brand new snowmobile I bought. So I was super excited about that. And uh, we were headed north, my dad, my brother and I, and caught some bad weather, trailer slid out, ended up rolling the trailer with uh, four sleds in it. And, you know, yard sailed four sleds, my brand new Apex being one of them. It had, I think, 600 miles on it <laughs> at the time. So got completely destroyed, you know, claimed insurance on it. I bought it back from insurance and rebuilt it and still have it. But that's awesome. I do, wow. I do like trail riding that sled a lot. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, good, uh, great sled there. You don't have much luck towing trailers, I take it. Eh? I was, I was kind of didn't know if I wanted to say that or not. Dad. I was gonna kind of wait, maybe if Doug was gonna say it's it, not, it's not There's... Doug, it's not too soon yet, that's for sure. No, it's all right. Those are the two incidents, those, those are the only Good. two. So, that one, Good. uh, and you know, to be fair to myself, I wasn't driving when the snowmobile trailer went over, but the uh, yeah. rolling the wedge with the side by sides on it that was a bummer, that was a tough day, but. Yeah, I bet. I bet. What a mess it made of the box of the truck too. I um, <laughs> yeah. I had a uh, I had an is a situation happen where I don't know whether the you know the little flap on the on the the claw on the ball of the trailer. I don't know yeah. whether it froze. It was it blistery cold, and I don't know whether it froze, like closed or open or whatever. I put it. It must have froze open. So I put it on. I snapped that down. Put the pin in locking chains on they were cables or actually the the thick aircraft cables that were the the safety yep. chains and it was an open um it was an open flow trailer and just headed up the road and there's a slight bend uh as you're leaving town going uphill so i was probably only doing 55 60 kilometers an hour so you know 30 miles an hour kind of thing and all of a sudden it was like a 
clunk and then the trailer was like out beside me kind of and it went on and ended up landing on a neighbor's lawn up the road and both sleds when it when the tongue dug into the ground and hit the curb both sleds broke out of the the super clamps holding them in and went right through the nose cone of the trailer and yeah. nothing got destroyed but my whole thing was if i was doing 100 kilometers like 60 miles an hour or 65 miles an hour just just three more minutes a minute more down the road i, I would even be and that thing came undone it could have been deadly if another car was coming and that type of thing it's now it's something you i really triple and double check and but accidents happen i mean that's why they're called accidents right yep no doubt no doubt that's the same story with ours could have been so much worse you know the trailer could have come into the cab of the truck it could have been in traffic luckily we just smashed up a few side by sides and moved on so not actually a big deal but yeah uh, i'm surprised like it's probably a good thing it let go because i'm surprised that it didn't it didn't take, take the, the truck, truck over yeah it it barely barely even bumped the truck i mean i felt it which is what made me look back there but not severely and uh it just it peeled the the hitch right off the ball the hitch just bent peeled off of it so yeah could have been a heck of a lot worse did you still yeah, have the oh. uh the banana yxz that got wrecked in that or did you guys offload that at some point no i still have it it's uh tucked over in the corner of one oh, of our buildings that's it's that's one unit i think that i've seen it in the comments and i'm one of the people that wants to see that thing ripping again that's, i know i think I yxz's know. are the, one of the coolest sounding so as much as they're not as fast as obviously the new like because there's obviously you have the 2j 2jps we're going to get into and all that stuff and there's people like the, uh, I can't remember the name, but the Hayabusa CVT X3. Like, you got stuff like that running, but there's some but a YXC yeah. banging through the gears at, like, 8,000 RPM that you just can't beat, right? Yeah. No, it's a it's a cool machine. And, I mean, that one's turned up pretty good. It makes 400 horsepower and uh, good engine build, good turbo build, Motec ECU, all that stuff. But the chassis is completely gone on it. I mean... I could yeah. fix it, but it would it would take more time and effort to fix than it than it's worth. So at some point, I'll find another frame for it and probably swap all my drive line over to it. But just haven't gotten there yet. Oh, for sure. So are you you've actually mastered the anti gravity feature? Have you on this photo? I wish I had mastered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my just this uh, past year, this past summer, my first attempt at a side by side backflip. Didn't make it. Uh, none of us really knew anything about building the backflip ramp. So our guy, Justin, <laughs> went out and gave it a shot. And uh, when I hit the upper lip, we didn't have it supported well enough. So it blew the jump out and uh, completely under rotated, landed on the front of the machine, totally destroyed it. <laughs> so that one is uh, ready for attempt two. We got the machine fixed. It's, it's working again. But... Uh, haven't tried the old backflip again yet, but it's coming. So what what goes through your head when you're when you think I'm gonna let, let's try and backflip a, a a side by side and then you step up to the plate, or was it a battle? Was it was it everyone else wanting to do it too? <laughs> no, it was uh, no. Honestly, we've been talking about backflipping one for a couple of years, and uh, like I knew it was doable right and it was doable at a reasonable amount of risk with the right safety gear isn't that big of a deal but nobody really wanted to do it because they knew they were probably going to get thumped pretty hard and uh that was just a particular week where we were talking about what we were filming and i wasn't super excited about the ideas we had lined up and we were having our monday morning meeting and i just said screw it i don't want to do that stuff i'm just going to do the backflip this week you know ask justin if he could go build a ramp and then we gave it a run. So didn't work out, but Good attempt. <laughs> I do, yeah, I do love the picture. <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, outdoor hobby guy, I think said, oh no, Dave Brennan says, when's the next sled challenge video coming out? <sighs> it depends on weather at this point. So we have a, uh, big trip planned at the end of january where a lot of the challenges are going to happen over the course of a few days so that's up in the upper peninsula of michigan where we're sure they'll have good snow at that point um but you know that's a month and a half out almost 
And until then, we're just kind of waiting on weather. So probably in the next couple of weeks, we'll have an update video um, where we'll go over the changes the guys have made and the mods they've done and where the sleds are at. Justin was out ripping wheelies on his today. So we'll have a little bit, but we're waiting on that snow to get into the, the heavy challenges. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, you, you kind of need that. <laughs> it helps. It helps. Oh, there's another thing there, I don't know if I need to grab a photo of, too. Good. You got it all. You got everything. <laughs> yeah, so this great. is actually when uh, grass drags were more popular around us. This Bavarian Cup in Frankenmuth was, you know, was a grass drag we used to go to every year. And uh, this was the first year they actually had a quad class. So I brought my Banshee out, and that was just the one picture I had from that day. But uh, we were also out there on a uh, F7 running uh, 700 stock class that day. And we ended up winning the stock class, and I ended up winning that quad class. So that was a good day. Pretty cool. Yeah. We're going to take the, the Betty Davis down, the Wolverine down to the Bavarian Cup there, Drew. <laughs> yeah but the the alignment's so bad i'll end up plowing into the guy next to me and then being 10 grand out on a banshee is the only problem that's right <laughs> we can put the d let's take it to side by side blog we'll we'll swap the dt 200 r engine into the wolverine and we'll couple uh, hours we'll get her a couple going. hours oh, yeah. Gosh. yeah that's oh, yeah. great just another, is another that, quad picture from back in the day. Is it the Silver Lake Dunes? Is that where you guys are ripping? Yeah, that is Silver Lake Dunes. So that's a couple hours from us across the state. And that's uh, that's a really cool place. It's not huge. It's only the ORV area is only a few hundred acres, but it's right on Lake, excuse me, right on Lake Michigan. So beautiful scenery. You're just out there ripping dunes, looking at the water. Yeah, it's, and, and the dunes are endless too. It's uh, I can't believe how deep you guys go into them. Yeah, especially when we get out to uh, when we go out to California and do the Glamis Dunes. Um, I want to say that's something like one hundred and eighty thousand acres. I think is the wow. the riding area. It's unfathomably large, and uh, it's impossible to see all of it or cover the whole area. It's, it's just endless. Yeah. Is that the event you were down there with uh, Cletus and sea boys were there and yes. Yep. Right. Yep. On. So that's Camp Razor. Glamis dunes camp razor. Yep. We've been doing that yeah. pretty much annually for a number of years. We don't make it every year, but for the most part, it just looks insane. Like, just insane the number yeah, of like people the, and when you guys get out in the flats and it's where everyone's doing the the drag racing or just doing poles essentially which <laughs> you guys always make comments about that which i think is funny but uh when it's just like a, a, a line i think matt had the drone up this year and it was just like far as the eye can see just like as you can see everybody's whips and all their lights and it's just machine after machine after machine yeah yeah that one is crazy it's uh i don't know how they get these numbers but it's pretty commonly said that on that event weekend it's there's roughly a quarter million people out there it's oh my gosh holy insane it's insane how do you it's how so do you large keep... it's okay yeah like like when you're ripping are you are you is your is your is your butt clenched up because you're worried about someone hitting you or like is it or is it fairly safe when you're uh at that particular event, when you're in one of the very popular areas, like they have Oldsmobile Hill or the drags, you know, in those few particular places, Sand Highway, your head's on a swivel the whole time because there's people running a million miles everywhere. But uh, once you bust out into the dunes and just start doing and the place is so big, it's uh, in five minutes, you can just be all by yourself out there ripping dunes. So it's it's a cool combination. That's wild. Are you using GPS or anything to find your way out there? Or is it pretty much just follow the leader? No, uh, we do use GPS. We've been out there enough now where the main points, like we can kind of navigate to them. You know, there's a mountain range out in the distance. You can see the mountain range, so you know which direction you're pointed, things like that. But uh, GPS is definitely important out there. It's easy to get turned around. If you get turned around in the wrong spot, you can have a, a very bad time. So. Yeah, that's wicked. 
I know it's, it's uh, it looks to me, it would be, I'd love to try that one day. And I think you'd need, is it, is it true? You'd need something with some good horsepower to, to, to play in the sand and have fun. It helps, you know, you can, uh, you can take a non-turbo side-by-side out there and do fine, but it definitely becomes more stressful, especially when you're new to it. If you find yourself in a big bowl and you don't have enough horsepower to hold the line around the bowl, it'll start to stress you out a little bit. So it's definitely better to be overpowered out there. It's it's you know, kind of like mountain sledding in a way, isn't it? It's kind of like mountain it, sledding in a way. Yeah, like you yeah. don't need to have, have all the power, but when you want to be on a 165 turbo... Going up some of those yeah. mountains with the safety, <laughs> almost like you're thinking, "Yeah, I probably will make this." Like the confidence of it, I think, increases when you have a little more power, right? Yeah, there's plenty of reason to have horsepower out in those dunes. It's not just for fun. You can absolutely use it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Greg Degur says my OCD was firing when I watched the Glamis video. Is in the dark. I'm surprised there isn't crashes everywhere. LED whip overload. LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there are crashes everywhere, <laughs> but I know yeah. what he's talking about. Yeah, that's awesome. Here's the Heliforce. Love it. Yeah. This thing is so versatile. <laughs> <laughs> Super useful. Yeah, you can haul wood with that sucker very fast. Exactly. Uh, How many cord of wood will it hold? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, actually. The bed's pretty much full with the radiator, so. Not super useful, yeah. but put a trailer on it. It's got the power. Wait, and yeah. and when you rode that in the sand, were you worried about it sucking in sand, or is it pretty filtered out? Not really. It's got a good filter on it. Going into it, I was worried about it overheating. You know, I was worried about the transmission getting hot. I was worried about the engine overheating, but uh, it didn't do any of that. It was totally fine the whole time. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, when the when you see this thing in the burnout competition and the GoPro footage from inside where you don't you don't know where the wall is or or where you are it must be just a, a freaky feeling it's it's tough that's the biggest battle with it is is seeing because it makes so much smoke so even with the the smaller burnout tires on it when you throw it into second it makes about 160 miles an hour of wheel speed and it does that instantly and basically as soon yeah. as you touch the throttle and light the burn off you throw it into second and you're right on the rev limiter and it just, especially with the mid-engine layout, it's got enough weight over those back tires where it makes just an extraordinary amount of smoke and you cannot see any <laughs> anything. And uh, with that engine out back and that weight over the rear end, it also accelerates quickly. So when you're in the burnout and you're trying to get out of your smoke and you start to roll out of the brake a little bit to move, it moves fast. So... <laughs> It's a it's a rowdy machine to drive for sure, but that's what what would you say it totally it weighs in total? Have you weighed the whole buggy? It's pretty heavy. Yeah, it's uh, twenty nine hundred pounds. Yeah. So wow. So that's Real, the thing. It would still get some good lighter, traction. It's, it's lighter than a Hellcat. Let's put it, it that yeah. way. Yeah, that's lighter right. A demon. <laughs> a demon. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, in general, yeah. it's light for an eight hundred horsepower vehicle, but for a side by side, she's pretty beefy. Yeah. Yeah. That would be something to see on the snow. Put some studs in the tires and let her hang. <laughs> yeah, that'll happen. That'll happen. We've yeah. got some soft ideas. So, but in the dunes, in the dunes, it's incredible to see with the paddle tires how much sand that thing's shoveling out the back. Like <laughs> it's spinning like it's on ice going up a sand dune hill. It's so uh -huh. crazy. Did you see the, the comment that Bam Customs just put in the chat? Dad? Yeah, that so doesn't. That, I'm putting that a v doesn't. I'm putting a V8 in my PT Cruiser. Thanks for the motivation, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> no regrets. No regrets. Don't steal my ideas. <laughs> LS swapping a PT Cruiser would be hilarious. Uh, yeah. Do you, do you uh, do you guys ever get flack from like the like you know around your shop and stuff as far as you know, law enforcement coming harassing you guys or, or anything like that, or does people know of you and know what you're all about? Yeah, we're, we're pretty good here now. We, uh, we don't have many neighbors at our current shop and, uh, the ones we do have, you know, we've made good friends with 
and in general, like we are just respectful of the street, you know, we're not out there going crazy because we have our space, we have our property, we've got the roads around the buildings we can, you know, drift and be silly in. So, you know, we don't really have issues with the police currently in the yeah. past. You know, I've done some stuff when we were at our last shop, particularly where they had to show up and say, Hey, don't do that anymore. And I said, okay, <laughs> but, uh, we're pretty good these days. That's good. Yeah. And uh, is this from Cletus and cars? These, uh, these crown Vicks. <laughs> this is, at? this is, yeah. So this is from uh, one of the Crown Vic race that Cletus puts on. And uh, this one you can see in the picture particularly was from Bristol Motor Speedway. And uh, that one was just very cool to me because it's one of those situations where I had never really seen a scenario where I would wind up racing on Bristol Motor Speedway, you know, with these top level professional race car drivers. And then somehow we found ourselves there just racing Bristol. You know, it was... Uh, yeah pretty awesome experience that is very cool uh there was chat in the like if if you guys want to tune into a podcast after this it's on youtube is look up the uh, side by side blog podcast where they they interview cletus and uh, they talk about cletus's collection of crown vicks and so forth nick is a is a racer by heart where does that come from he can just drive you know the guy uh never has had any formal training or really done a lot of formal racing. He just uh, likes to drive and is fast and has a pretty good natural feel for, uh, you know, feeling the car and understanding what it, what it's doing. He kind of can just drive. So, yeah, right on. That's the thing. It's like uh, they say he's putting down good numbers too, which is really impressive. Yeah. Yeah, he does well out there. He's been uh, he's been in the hunt for the win a couple of times and has caught some tough breaks. But yeah, pretty wicked. This, so were you guys commentating at the race here? That was just a picture we took in the uh, media center afterwards. We weren't actually on the mic. We were just sitting there laughing about how ridiculous it was that we were there and got this picture <laughs> that's cool right on now when when you're driving those cars do they take care of all the maintenance on them or do you guys get to tune them and and mess around with them no they they do like that's a really awesome program you literally show up and the cars are there ready to race all we do is decorate them you know you throw a that's paint job on them just to make it your own but they're all uh, completely taken care of. Nitrous is ready to go. Tires are all, you know, set up. They're aligned. They, you know, have roll cages in them all. The interiors are stripped. Like, they do a ton of work for those events and uh, pull people in, put them in the driver's seat, and let them rip. It's pretty awesome. That's freaking cool. And uh, and some big names too. Like, there's a lot of uh, a lot of big names you're racing against. So it's uh, it's great to see you, homeboys you know, throwing it down out there. It's pretty wild. Putting yeah. up numbers too. The, the, you yeah. mentioned those two came pretty close to the win that one year. I think that was a couple of years back. Or was that this past one in the spring that he almost won? I lose track was, of them now. Yeah. We've, we've been yeah. in so many of them, but a number of times. I mean, we've got a, a few second place finishes and been up front close to the end of the race multiple times, had car problems, yada, yada, but. It's uh, it is a cool thing. So we've been on the, that track with NASCAR drivers and IndyCar drivers, and been able to hang. So that's wicked. Maybe his calling's not not come yet. You know. <laughs> so David Brennan says he daily drives a '97 Grand Marquis. Same thing. Yep. Awesome. Heck yeah. <laughs> They're great cars. You cannot kill them. They're so tough. Yeah. There oh, go. <laughs> that's day one right there. That's right after I loaded that on the trailer, brand new. That was my first side by side. Is that uh, right? That's awesome. Yep. Brings back. Yep. Brings. And that was a one thousand R, was it? Yeah, yeah. That was first a base year of them? model. Twenty thirteen, a first year Maverick. Yeah, twenty thirteen base model. So no power steering, just as cheap as I could get. I just, I basically went out and said, I need, you know one that has just about as the most horsepower you can get. The Razor had a little bit more power at the time, but it was more money than I wanted to spend. So uh, 
I picked up a Maverick. That thing was a beast. Kind of started it all. That's wicked. How many years did you have that for? Um, two or three. Might have been yeah. three. Because I ended up buying uh, my YXZ. I think it was in 2017. And then shortly after that, I, I sold the Maverick. But Pretty cool. All right, is it kind of like snowmobiling where they're all getting the manufacturers are all building really good stuff. So you can't really go wrong with whatever, you know, side by side you choose, or is there some standouts in your mind? I think everybody's building, you know, reasonable quality stuff for sure. And for a lot of the market, everybody's building good stuff, but there's definitely a couple of standouts in like the top tier performance category, you know, this new Maverick R, and the Pro R from Polaris, like they're kind of in a league of their own in terms of speed, capability, suspension, those types of things. But everybody builds good stuff for the most part, for sure. Yeah. Are they, are they, when you talk about Maverick R and, and so forth, are they, are they, are they something that the everyday buyer should, should pick up or are they specifically more suited if you're going to be racing? They're definitely more suited towards like a uh, southwest U.S. area, a lot of desert riding, right? If you're going to go out and your average speed for the day is going to be 60, 70 miles an hour in the wide open desert and you're bashing through stuff, like that Maverick R is a machine for you. If you're more on the East Coast, you're riding tight wooded trails, not so much. So it's uh, definitely an area-specific machine, in my opinion. It's huge. They're massive. Yes. Yeah. So if you're going to buy a used one, what do you recommend people look for? Like what, how, how do you recommend people go about, about shopping for their first side-by-side? -side? Oh my gosh, that, that is so hard because the variation and how these things are treated <laughs> is, is wild, you know? And I don't, I don't know how anybody buys anything anymore other than going to Facebook marketplace for the, <laughs> for the most part. I suppose if you can find a consigned machine from a dealer that's at least been gone through, you can maybe have a little confidence in it. Um, unless you feel like you're pretty mechanically inclined and can check these things out yourself and go for a test drive. But, you know, find some buddies that got them, drive them, see what you think you want and start looking, I suppose. Yeah. And here you are with Hoonigan. Yeah, that was that was quite the day there. It was uh, just a wild thing to be a part of, to have built this, you know, very wild side by side, really intending to sand drag for the most part, and then have the opportunity to throw some fat slicks on it and go out and race, you know, the Hoonicorn, which is a, obviously an iconic car, and uh, hang out with Ken Block. And that whole Hoonigan crew, like that was a pretty wild thing to be a part of. Special yeah. day for sure. Special day for sure. So, anything stick out in your mind about Ken uh, that that you want to share with people? <sighs> you know, I I tell people this all the time. It was uh, it was a busy day, so everybody was very busy because when we filmed, I think the day we raced. They filmed three or four episodes and the couple had gotten behind due to mechanical issues with the competitor. So it was a very hectic day. But when it was our time to go out and film, um, Ken very much made it a point, you know, to come over and have a conversation with me in particular and was just uh, very friendly and such a genuine guy. It was a great interaction. And then uh, we did the we did the race. And uh, it was his daughter, Leah, that actually drove the car when we did it. That was their big surprise. Um, but I'm out there racing this 1,300 horsepower side-by-side -side on an airstrip with no rubber down with oil and all this stuff. So, you know, like I'm getting a little wild out there. Machine spinning. I'm pedaling it all the way down. It's, you know, a couple of pretty crazy runs, but got it down through there successfully. And uh, I remember after the second race, you know, Ken walked over i was still in the machine and you know just told me good job he said man you did a great job driving that like that's awesome shook my hand and like that was a high moment for me uh 
you know, to have Ken Block tell me that I did a good job driving something was like, okay, that hits me. I'll take that input. And then, uh, but yeah, in general, other than that, the uh, little bit of time I got to spend with him, just a great guy. Great guy. Yeah. That, that's awesome. What a, what a, um, a, a, like quite an accomplishment to, to be there and meet him and, and get to chat with him like that. That's, that's uh, really cool. Um, yep. You're racing a, a four wheel drive, you know, high horsepower car. You're in a two wheel drive side by side. How did you do? You know, not too bad. It, uh, yeah, that car on that day was about 1600 horsepower and all wheel drive, like you said. And uh, we did okay. We only got two races. The uh, first race, um, I lost by probably a car and a half. And then uh, we came back and I loosened up the rear suspension a little bit, did a little longer burnout, got it to hook a little better. And the second race, I think it was maybe a half a car to a car. Like she just got around me at the end of the track. And uh, I came back thinking I was going to get a third race and I was hyped up because I knew like one more adjustment, you know, one more hit on these tires, like this next race, I got it. I got it. Like I knew I had that third race. And then uh, because we were so tight on filming, they had to move on. So I never got the third race, which is unfortunate, but you know, they were close races. We gave them, uh, we made them sweat for sure. So, yeah, from when I was yeah. watching that, um, I think you guys were one of the closest to beating the Hoonicorn out of every single competitor they had um, in yeah. that second run where it was like, you get when Leah was driving it, like you said, it wasn't, it wasn't like the 1400 horsepower Hoonicorn. It was now like they had it 1600 horsepower. They had it tuned up and a little bit yeah. faster. But uh, yeah, I remember what, like you said, I, I, I said off the show, um, Obviously, I said that this was how I discovered Side by Side Blog uh, for the first time. It was all of a sudden you got this crazy looking razor. I'm a, I love Jurassic Park, and there's just like this Jurassic Park razor with a two JZ engine. It's like my favorite thing is coming together. <laughs> and it's like who's this? Who's this like goofball with a mullet with Side by Side Blog? And then yeah, it was just like oh my god, give him a run for their it's, money. Yeah, crazy how people find you. That's for sure, eh, Doug? Yeah, that was uh, that was crazy in general. But I, I completely agree. Like that's how we see ourselves is just a bunch of goofballs building wacky stuff. So to drag across there and get to race that car around those people and actually be one of the few to go heads up with them and you know make them sweat a little bit. That was a that was a good day. That was a good day. Yeah, yeah. And it's not bad when it's Leah Block to get beat by a girl. I yeah. I am not mad about it whatsoever. <laughs> uh, I would have liked that third race, but I'm not mad. I'm not mad. Yeah. Uh, oh, for sure. This is the OG, is it, right there? <laughs> yeah, that's the OG <laughs> map again. And this one's just funny to me because at the time, you know, this isn't that long ago, really. But at the time, that was a big jump. You know, in the day, we thought that was that was really cool. You know, I think I had 12, 14 inches of suspension travel. These things are, you know, just starting to get capable. So we're out there sending them. And, uh, you know, considering what they'll do now, it's funny to look back on. But Did you break much on that stock one or is it pretty tough? Not really. That machine was pretty tough. I mean, I broke belts on it and yeah. I might have broken an axle or bent one arm, but in general, that thing uh, took a beating pretty well. That was a good machine. A typical, typical side-by-side -side maintenance then. Not bad. Yeah. 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 You, you don't see many for sale, and if you do, they have clutch problems. Now, now that's the photo I sent I sent to my dad here because uh, I wanted <laughs> to get this because obviously we need the snowmobile to side-by-side -side connection. I thought nothing better than when you guys took a Mach Z. I think it was a 98 Mach Z. Or yep. Mock Z, sorry, as we call it. Mock yeah, Z. Mock Z, Z, you, right. <laughs> you just made this Frankenstein of Cle one of Cletus's old side by sides, and yeah, kind of made this out of it. That is, uh, yeah, we still have this machine, and I still love driving that thing. It's such a blast. And the backstory was, yeah, we had this chassis from uh, Cletus, and didn't really have much to do with it. And we had this idea to do a twenty-four hour build off. I'm sorry, it wasn't 24 hours. It might have been. I forget the time limit, but we had some short period of time um, to do a build-off. 
and it was essentially my brother and I versus a couple of the other guys. Their project was to install heads and a turbo kit on our mud truck, on our mega truck. And uh, my brother and I's project was to install this Mach Z engine in this X3. So we slammed that thing together over the course of a couple of days. And uh, it basically just rips. <laughs> it's, it's super light. And, uh, you know, it's got a good set of pipes on it. It's got a good set of electron carbs on it. Thing screams and it's just a blast to drive. Yeah, I, I, it I sounds wish I could have got so a, good. A, I wish I could have got a better shot of this, but just uh, for the viewers who don't know, the if you look at the dash, the tack and the and the fuel gauge is out of the dash of the mock, right? Yep, it is. <laughs> and then it's a pull start still as well that you use the same yep. recoil on the side. So someone from the outside has to start it, which is one of my favorite things because that means someone always has to get out or be there to start it. Just keeping it pull start, I think was was a great idea. It was a great choice. <laughs> yeah, start kit on it keeps it the idea. It's just it's a snowmobile. We we basically parked the snowmobile in the back of our side by side. Pretty much, yeah. We mounted the engine and uh, we used the uh, clutch out of the side by side on it. Just happened to be the same taper, so that worked out great. And the Sweet. you know radiator out of the side by side, and then. It's just the stock Mach Z engine. I freshened up the top end. It's got a set of crankshaft pipes on it and the, the electron carbs. We use the uh, wire harness out of the sled and just sort of extended it where we need to. And it just works. <laughs> it just works. Yeah, it's sweet. Yeah, those 800s were awesome. You know, you keep them serviced and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll last. Yep. yep. We, we're, we're the conversion. <laughs> They're asking about tracks in the chat. We have tracks and skis on this thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's that same sled. That's the old two-stroke X3. And uh, I think this was last winter. We put the tracks on the back and uh, mounted a set of skis on the front and ripped it around. Unfortunately, we didn't have a heck of a lot of snow, but we were just intending to test it out a little bit. And then we were going to take it up north and uh, ride it in some deeper snow. You know, of course, we broke it. By the time we fixed it, snow was all gone for the year, so we didn't get it to use it as much as we intended. But it Did looks the 800 cool. have enough. It looks cool. Did the 800 have enough power to drive that though? Got plenty of power, honestly. Did those, it? Uh, yeah, those those tracks again, you know, naturally gear you way down because the uh, the drive wheel in them is probably only 14 inches in diameter, I'd guess. So. It's like having a 14 inch tire on there you got all sorts of torque and uh yeah it had plenty it had plenty we just unfortunately broke it before we got it into real snow oh that's too bad yeah and here's two jp right there just giving her yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know if you did a spec i don't know if you did a spec rundown on that why don't you tell the why don't you tell the fine people what's uh what, what's done to that what's all in it yeah, so yeah, because someone said about a high, sorry, someone said about a Hayabusa side by side. Well, <laughs> there, yeah, there is a uh, there is a Hayabusa side by side based out of uh, Michigan here, uh, owned by some friends of ours, Phil and Brad Sarah, and it's a beautiful build. It's ultra fast. Uh, this one is the machine we built. We call Two JP. Um, and the reason we call it that, it's a play on a couple different names. It's got a Toyota 2JZ engine in it, and it's wrapped like the Explorer from the original Jurassic Park movie. So you take 2JZ and Jurassic Park, put them together, you get 2JP. Um, and it's essentially a just a dedicated drag race build. So the idea stemmed from the want to pull some automotive interest over to the side-by-side market we were looking at ways to you know engage the automotive people it's a much larger group obviously um talked about ls swapping one but everybody ls swaps everything you know it's done a billion times over so we said well okay what's another iconic automotive engine that you don't see as much and we decided on the 2jz so at this point it's an all billet stroker 2jz um with a big turbo on it linked to a power glide, which uh, hooks to a nine inch independent Ford rear end and some big old axle shafts. And it makes roughly 1,350 horsepower 
at the crank <laughs> and uh it just it rips it's an absolute animal um driving it is always about power management so if we're actually trying to go fast with it you're managing the power you know you're pulling it in slow keeping the thing planted on the ground sometimes like this particular event we weren't really trying to do anything other than put a show on so we'll send the power in a little faster and just let it do wheelies down the drag strip and it's exciting and everybody cheers and it's uh it's very, very rowdy. <laughs> very yeah, rowdy. Like look, will, at the, will look at the shoe out the back of sand coming out of the back of that. I yep. know. <laughs> it's just, it's, you know, it's a hundred feet of, of like a wall of sand behind the thing. Just crazy. Yep. The uh, Will it go right over? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It'll flip right on its lid if you let it. It's, uh, yeah, jeez. Yeah, and it's done uh, zero to sixty in the sand in one point seven four seconds. I think is the best time we've recorded. So you know, on the sand, zero to sixty under two seconds. She's she's pulling. It gets. Yep, it, Masser wants to know if it's as fast as Cletus's Supra. I don't know. I don't know what kind of numbers his Supra's running. Honestly, off the top of my head, put it in the comments if you know what he's running in the quarter with that yeah i'm sure they'll I mean, jacob will look it up he'll he'll find out for you there's a better picture of it there oh yeah so it was it was purpose built for sand but you've had it on asphalt and everywhere else yeah you know just uh always trying to do cool things so it was set up and intended to be raced in the sand but we throw slicks on it and run it down the drag strip occasionally it's uh questionable from a safety perspective you know, due to how fast it is, and certainly the cage is not specced out for, uh, okay, 9.6 in the quarter mile. So 2JP has been a 8.1 in the quarter mile, and that was out of the throttle at 1,000 feet. So it'll go wow. seven if I actually hold it all the way through. But Yeah. Is that with it? I wonder if the 9.6 is Cletus's new engine, because he had that engine redone in that. Yeah, I don't. But I don't know. Unfortunately, I get behind on everybody's videos, even our friends. You know, it's so busy around here. I don't always keep up. But yeah, well, Greg DeGuer wants to know what the cause of the bunny hop to JP does because that's nuts. Yeah, so that's a that's an interesting one. Um, I haven't gotten a good set of shocks for the back of it yet that are really custom set up for the kind of horsepower and weight that it has. So what we were finding using the stock shocks even with the tender springs removed is that when we come off the trans brake we would blow through the shock travel the rear shocks would hit the bump stops bounce the rear end of the car off the ground unload the tire and spin real bad so this last time out what we did to fight that for just a quick easy fix is we put a basically a set of truck springs on the back of it so we went from a 300 pound spring or 350 pound spring to a 700 pound spring. And uh, it does a very good job controlling the back of the car. But if you have to chop the throttle in a wheelie, you have so much spring rate, the shock can't control it, doesn't have enough dampening valving in it. And that heavy duty spring just tries to launch the rear end of the car over top of you. And the whole thing ends up doing a bunny hop. Uh, 70 miles an hour it's uh it's an interesting machine but do, do you think it would have been better to have it longer did you want to keep the look of a side by side by keeping it short yeah it was uh we kept the wheelbase of the side by side on purpose because we wanted it to still be a side by side at the end of the day i think if we stretched it too much farther it would get too far into the realm of just being something you know completely different and custom so i wanted it to still look like a side by side yeah that's what i was thinking when i when i first seen it so what do you yep. run for gas in that is it is it race gas uh throwing sparks ass it's on e85 currently so we run uh renegade brand e85 in it yeah david says that build is awesome it truly is how long does it take to go from an idea of i'm gonna do this i'm going to build this 2jz uh, powered side by side to actually having something that you can drive 
two JP was uh, that one was roughly ten months, I think, from when we started to actually kick off parts to starting it up for the first time. Um, but of course, that's not ten months working solid. That's on the side, late nights, weekends, you know, picking away at it as we could fund it and as there was time to do it. Um, it was a big, it was a big project though. That one had a lot of custom stuff in it. So that one was long-term. The, uh, the Hell Force build that we did more recently with the Hellcat engine in it, that was only about three months, but you know, Again, that was a that was a pretty hard push. That was a lot of late nights and weekends for those few months. But it's uh, do you, it's do, a, you build, it's do you a build, do you build something like that with with the idea of hey, I've got this event, I got to have it ready for, or are you just building it as you know a personal goal to have it done by a certain date? Uh, yeah, for Hellforce, we were aiming for an event, so that one we were targeting one of the uh, Cletus and Cars events because he's putting on you know, basically the best burnout contests in the country at this point going absolutely wild with these burnout contests. So we were targeting one of his events in particular to debut it. So the, the push was on there. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool to watch that. I'm glad you guys showed more of, of the other burnouts uh, being done there and the winners and things like that. It just wasn't all about uh side-by-side -side blog. It was about all the other people that, put the time and effort in as well to, to do an event like that. Yeah. Everybody's really stepping their game up on that stuff. There's a lot of cool builds out there. Yeah. Oh, do yeah. you still have a band? Do you still own a Banshee? I still do. Actually. I still have that one in this picture. This uh, yellow one closest to us is mine and it's sitting over in the other shop right now. I've had right. that since I was 16. So that's another picture yeah. from Silver Lake dunes here in Michigan. And this was, Another thing we would do every weekend, you know, just grudge racing out there was constant every single weekend. And I used to love that. That's awesome. You come by it naturally, right? This craziness of racing and, and doing stuff in the, in the sand. Oh, and here's wow. your sled. Here's your sled collection. So what are we looking <laughs> at here? That's yeah. Okay. So this is my uh, current actual personal sled fleet so you know nothing here that's tied to side by side blog or i have for any business reason this is just my personal stuff that i've kept um the closest one is my trail sled 2012 apex xtx um the rx1 next to it is was is what i was trail riding prior to that and uh it's kind of neat it's got a built engine ported head high compression cams you know it gets it pretty good and then uh, the next two sleds are kind of sleds that are just personal to me. And I picked up this year because with Yamaha announcing that they're getting out of sleds, I figure this stuff's going to get harder to get. Value's going to go up. So I got a 99 SRX there. That's just a clean one owner um, thing. I just wanted to have around to ride every once in a while. Love it. And then, Yep, the uh, 96 VMAX 4 next to it. That's another one, super clean, just all original. It's got a set of silencers on it, but all stock. Another one I just want to keep around right every once in a while, keep in good shape. And then uh, hiding down there at the end, the next one is my uh, ice drag sled that we looked at earlier. So that's my oh, Turbo yeah. RX1 swap VMAX 4. And then uh, 78 Exciter 440 next to that. Just uh, right something on. I picked up because it was similar to my first sled. Did a little restoration on it, and that's. The I wasn't fleet sure if that one. was. I, I wasn't sure if that was an Exciter or a GP, but I had yeah. the Exciter 440 with the with the black and gold. It was an eighty one. Um, yep, yep. Color format, and I always thought it'd be neat to still have that and get one of the new Sidewinders that are black and gold. So I know, yeah. I know it. There's a couple like that that are still on my list, but. Yeah, Probably throwing spark says. Throwing spark says you need a 1980 SRX. I want one of those, but they're not cheap anymore. Everybody's figured them out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I think you're right about the uh, Yamaha getting out of the game. I think there will be a few people scooping up 
um, some of the old Yamahas, whether it's good or bad, maybe they won't know what they're getting and, right. uh, and get into the wrong Yamaha, but you've got a, you've got quite the collection. I seen Mark Bo in the, in the chat and he, uh, he's an apex guy. So, um, okay. or was, okay. so he, he will love this collection. Still wears his Yamaha snowsuit. You should trade him your Skidoo oh. jacket for his Yamaha <laughs> jacket. We could do that. We could work something out. Yeah, that's uh, right. This one here just fa <laughs> This is just an old trail riding picture. And this is, uh, you know, again, in the wintertime, just what we did every weekend. So we drive up north, and this was kind of our core group of guys. And we put on roughly 2,500 miles a year and spent a lot of time, me, my dad, my brother, a couple of buddies, just trail riding in northern Michigan. That was uh, the thing yeah, to do. Good job. Greg, Greg's going back to the other picture. He says he don't even remember the VMAX 4 in red, and he's not, and he's old, he says. <laughs> uh, they came in red two years, 96 and 97. Neither one of them were very high production, especially the 97s. So you don't see very many red ones. Yeah. You, you don't see. Red's, red's just a here. weird color for Yamaha in general. Like even what you you and uh, um, uh, Mike had last year for sleds, for the cheap sled challenge being two red Yamahas. It's like. Yeah. Buy blue or black. Right, right. Yeah. Blue, oh, and they had the, like the their... VMAX Deluxe that were silver as well. But <laughs> yeah, there were some strange ones in there. But my buddy just uh, yeah. just picked one of those up a 2001 VMAX Deluxe 700 triple. Yeah. So. 96 VMAX 4. Mark Bow says he loves it. Yeah. But so you, uh, this is in the UP, is it? Or where did you find yourself riding a lot? Yeah. We rode the upper peninsula of Michigan. Uh, most of the time so munising area grand marais area a lot for anybody that's familiar with michigan that was kind of our hub so that's probably where this picture was taken i don't recognize it exactly but yeah those are the days eh? the with a nice vintage pictures lots of snow there yeah yeah so here's two jp again dragging in the pavement what are you racing against there this was a fun one too. So this one, uh, I was racing Cletus McFarland. So that's his, uh, very well-known car on his channel. He calls Leroy, uh, yeah. which is technically, you know, it's an exoskeleton Corvette basically. And is, uh, kind of the car that is responsible for really launching his YouTube channel, which is now massive. Obviously he's hugely popular. So that particular car, um, in the circle of automotive YouTube is extremely well known. And uh, we were down in his vent. He, I was sitting in two JP. He rolled up in Leroy and called me out. So we went at it for a few runs and it got wild and ridiculous. It was a pedal fest. We were both spinning all over the place, almost wrecking, you know, <laughs> shooting flames. It was a wonderful time. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. What is that? Uh, you've, you've hung out with Cletus a lot. Uh, what, what's he like in real life? Uh, he's pretty much the best guy ever. He, uh, yeah. his, his energy that you see in the videos, you know, his personality and, uh, you know, his competitiveness, that energy he has for motorsports is just a hundred percent real right down to his core. You know, we've hung out with him a lot you know, on some long trips, he's been up here and hung out with us in Michigan a number of times. And, uh, even after a number of days go by when the camera's off, he's the same guy. He's still jacked. He's doing it. He wants to race. He wants to rip, uh, just, yeah. Great dude overall. Yeah. I'd love to hang with him. He seems like a lot of, a lot of fun. Every time you see him in, in, uh, other people's videos, that's when the, that's when you can tell the tale, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Very cool. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah. yeah so this, this is, is a, this is one from uh, one of the events we put on here. We call uh, race day and this is a lineup for our bracket race. So this one's fun to me because it's another thing that's just sort of escalated from a hobby back in the day. Um, way before side by side blog started. My parents had 14 acres and I would organize events that I started calling race day. And it was just, you know, me and a handful of my buddies on quads 
And uh, year after year, it got bigger and bigger. It turned into trucks. It turned into bikes. It turned into side by sides eventually. And then we made it part of side by side blog. And now it's, you know, a real event we hold twice a year. Rent out a facility, throw a big party, do camping. And uh, it's just another example of something really cool that's come out of just a hobby. That is very cool. How many people do you get at these race day events? We don't take an exact head count, um, especially for spectators, because it's free to spectate. But like estimation on spectators, some of our bigger events has been probably 2,000 people. And then wow. uh, I think the most side-by-sides we've had registered for one day is like 130. Um, so a pretty good number. And it's, uh, you know, just about packs the facility and can't fit a heck of a lot more. So. That's pretty wild. Throwing sparks is Doug. Have you ever considered doing King of the Hammers? We have a couple of times. So we've been out to King of the Hammers a couple of times, did some riding out there. Um, have considered racing it. It's just, uh, it's a tough balance. A race like that is, again, it's all the way across the country from us. And I've never wanted to do it unless we could actually commit a reasonably full effort to it and go out there and try to compete, right? Obviously racing and something like that for the first time, you're not necessarily expecting to win, but if we do it, I want to be able to put real effort into it and give it a real honest shot. And uh, when you're trying to do YouTube and, you know, do videos every week or multiple videos a week to commit the time to that serious of a race program is, is pretty tough. You know, it's uh, one of these things where you don't want to do it half ass and that's all you got time for. So you just don't do it at all. Um, maybe, maybe we'll figure it out, but time is tough. Yeah. He says brutal times 10 is what he put on the. Oh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. 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 Another, another picture of 2KP here. Yeah. That's, uh, that's at the race day event we were just talking about so this is a beautiful facility here in michigan again just a couple hours away from us it's called silverback off-road speedway definitely one of the you know best sand drag facilities i would say probably one of the fastest sand drag tracks in the country they're doing a great job with it do a great job with the event so it looks firm in front of the car it doesn't look very firm behind it <laughs> yeah <laughs> right right <laughs> Yeah, that machine makes you, a mess wherever it goes. You've chewed, you've chewed it right up. You know, the uh, what kind of protective equipment do you wear when you're when you're dragging like this? Do you wear like what you'd find a in a drag strip, or, or can you tone it down a bit in the sand? In the sand, I tone it down a bit. You know, I have enough confidence in the machine where you know if we're making a three hundred foot hit on the sand, I'll just wear reasonable gear. I put a good Simpson helmet on and obviously we have really good harnesses in it. I'll throw gloves on. Um, if we're going to make a quarter mile pass on the asphalt, then we're going to ramp it up some more. That's when I'll put on a full fire suit and, you know, really go for it, throw the Hans device on and all that. But in the sand, we just give her a good rip, you know, be careful. Yeah, just another normal day on the on the on the <laughs> on the dirt, is it? Uh, <laughs> it's amazing what becomes normal sometimes. Yeah. Uh your your life is far from normal. I understand. Well, that's very cool. I thank you for for joining us tonight and sending those pictures in. That was a lot of fun. Uh, really nice to see the the other side of Doug. Well, you're the same as what you're on the channel, but <laughs> that's, uh, I'm, I'm totally honored because, uh, Snowbill side uh of Doug. yeah, well, and that's saying your, your channel is so huge. I'm just like a, a fart in the wind to side by side blog. And I appreciate how quick you responded and, and said, that sounds like fun right away. And you, you can't understand how much that means to me, you know, to, uh, to hear a guy that I look up to and respect and, and, uh, have, have paved the way for smaller guys like me. That's for sure. Hey, well, thank, yeah, thank you guys for, uh, for having me on, you know, obviously it wasn't that long ago. We just started out as a relatively small channel as well. So, um, 
respect what you guys are doing. It's great for the sport. This has been a great time. You've done an awesome job with it. And uh, anytime anybody gives me the chance to talk about snowmobiles, I'm in, basically. I don't get to do that as much as I'd <laughs> like to. So I had a great time. Thank you, guys. Well, hopefully we can see the rest. And maybe we'll get the whole crew on next year to, to talk about snowmobiles. <laughs> yeah, maybe at, the end, maybe at the end of the challenge. That would be a good thing up. to do to to because like that's also up, I, yeah, no, you go ahead. No, I was just gonna say because that's usually also around our finale as well at the end of our podcast season. Um, yeah, as well, if you guys are planning it up end of February, start of March ish. That that could be one of the last episodes that could actually work out. Yeah, okay. not the twenty sixth okay. though because uh, because Levi is coming on on episode one hundred and eight. Oh, we hit a, episode nice. one hundred next week. We're, this is episode We're at 99. 99. I forgot to mention that. I was going to mention that this is the great one that we got to have a shot for the yeah. great one. Gretzky. That's right. We should have. <laughs> Gosh. I'll invite those yeah. guys. They might be too upset after they lose the sled challenge, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll see, see what happens for sure. <laughs> uh, sled Side by Side blog is awesome. This has been a great show, Gary and Drew. Thank you for your hard work, Doug. I agree. Very exciting show tonight. Uh, I, we got in there from Throwing Sparks, but. Thank you, everybody, in the chat for the engaging chat. And, uh, yeah, Renegade X is a great show, very enjoyable. Yeah, I, I had a blast, Doug. I, I thank you again. If you want to hang out afterwards, just say a couple words after the we get off the air here. We can chat. and uh, But I'll, I'll just roll the credits. I won't take up any more of your time. Sounds good. Thank you, take guys. Care. Take care, guys. Have a good night. No problem. Uh, study, Drew. You got a big test coming up, you know. <laughs> Less than 12. It's a journey for